Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. Genshin Impact had its biggest update yet with its 2.0 update adding the Inazuma region and associated story quests and characters and so much fucking stuff into this great game that you and I both love. And while we have talked a lot about Genshin Impact since it launched last year, we haven't done an episode where it's like the title topic. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be the main topic today, is you and I talking about our love of Genshin Impact, specifically what we've been doing in the in the 2.0 update, which uh, I, for one, have been mainlining like it's Black Tar Heroin. Yes, it is, it is the most concentrated Genshin Impact I've played since dragon spine uh which was like last december and january um so yeah because they they've had lots of good updates in between there but this is the first like sit down motherfucker and play this game update they've done in a while <laughs> i mean it's like it hasn't quite like doubled the size of the game but it's like a thirded the size of the game yes it's it's a third region and it's huge and it's amazing and if you haven't played genshin impact you should because it's wonderful um, and I had kind of pulled myself away from it for a couple months there, but then like, Sean, this morning, I rolled out of bed, I plopped myself in front of my TV, and I thought, I'm going to play a little Genshin Impact before the podcast, and then you texted me and said, hey, can we record the podcast, like, two hours late, and I'm like, that's fine, and then I just played for another two hours, I just, I played for like three hours this morning, I could not stop, I got, uh, Kamisato this morning in a drop. Um, nice. I got her as well. I'll talk about because it was very fateful uh, when I got her. Uh, okay. It felt like like oh, I, this was a good time. I wasn't sure if I was going to go for her, but then I I got her in one of the story quests to like test, and I realized she was a pretty perfect slot for my team. So yes, because you have Hu Tao, right? Yes, I do. Yes, she would work very well on a Hu Tao team. She yeah. does. I, I, it's chaotic as shit, but it's wonderful. Anyway, we will talk about that later. Genshin Impact uh, is life. But we will also talk about a little bit of news. Comic-Con was this week, sort of. But Comic-Con, even more irrelevant now than E3. Um, very little news, but there was a Dragon Ball panel that was entertaining. And there was also some Doctor Who news. We'll cover that. Uh, and then finally, a little bit of news from California on Blizzard Activision. Yeah, it's sad. It's fucked up. We'll talk about that. But Sean, how have you been? I've I've been pretty good. Uh, yeah, like I mean, in terms of stuff I've been doing, it was I watched quite a bit of Gundam Age shortly after we did that podcast, and then a few days after that podcast, Genshin Impact came out, and I have only played <laughs> Genshin Impact since that update. I mean, I played a little bit more of the Neo Two DLC. I'm almost. I got so close to finishing the Neo Two DLC before the Genshin Impact uh, update came out. Didn't quite make it. And I told myself, like, oh, I'll kind of balance and do a little bit of Genshin, finish off the Neo 2 stuff. And I haven't gone back to Neo 2 since Genshin uh, dropped. But the other, but one thing I do want to talk about is the reason why we're recording this podcast uh, for us a couple hours later than normal. It's going to be the same time for everyone in terms of when they get it. Um, but that's because I have finally resolved one of, like, the long-hanging, little, tiny, annoying things that has been uh, at this house since we moved in, which is... Um, the way where I'm situated in this house is that it's a two story house. I'm on the second story. Um, and it's kind of like it, every both stories of the house kind of have everything you would need for it to almost be like an apartment. Like there's a small, almost like kitchen type setup on the second floor. And there's like a media room up here. Um, like all the second floor stuff is not as like nice and spacious as the first floor stuff, but it's a really well set up house. That's like good for the specific thing the situation I'm in right now where I'm sort of living here for maybe like a year or so um, while I'm getting situated in Texas looking for a job and all of that. In the media room up here, when we moved in, I was very surprised to discover that there was a massive fucking TV that was left in this media room. And I came into the room and I was like, oh, they, there's just this giant TV in here. That's crazy. But then when I went to go turn the TV on, it did not turn on. Um, so I was like, well, that's very weird. And it was, it is, was wall mounted directly to the wall. Like you couldn't, it wasn't like a wall mount where you could pull it away or anything. It was just stuck onto the wall itself. And so I was trying to see like, is it unplugged? Is there something I can do about this? Like what kind of TV even is it? Cause I can't see the serial number or the model or anything. Cause that's all on the back. Um, and I couldn't get at that. Couldn't budget off the stand. It was just fucking stuck. And I was very tired from moving. So I just left it like that. Then I had been fiddling with it over the past like couple of weeks, or I guess like a month or so at this point, and eventually learned the reason why it was stuck on this mount was because 
it was unplugged. Everything from the TV was unplugged, but the cables were just left like jammed in between the wall mount <laughs> and the TV in such a way that it was like almost impossible to move. So I had to like get my hand back there and like try to unlodge some of the cables and kind of pull them out under the TV. But I couldn't pull them all the way out because the cables ran through the wall behind where the TV was mounted into a utility closet room on the other side where they were coming through a wall and they were getting stuck in there. So I was like, well, I can't get these cables all the way out. The TV is like lodged here in a weird way. And at that point, my brother, um, who's the only other person really I know in this entire state uh, who would be able to help me move this TV, he was like in somewhere else uh, hanging out with my sister-in-law's family, um, his wife. So I wasn't able to kind of like deal with this TV situation for a couple of weeks. And then finally, my brother is back in town. He came over to this house helped me move the TV and like unlodge it a little bit and lift it up off of the stand, which is where I then was able to get behind the TV and learn that this TV is uh, from 2006. It is a Sony Bravia KDL-XBR3. It is a 52 inch screen, but the dimensions of the TV are more about a 70 inch TV because this is a 1080p TV from 2006 that when it came out was $6,800. Jesus Christ. Yep. And it is a piece of shit by 2021 standards because it is a 15-year-old TV. It weighs 115 pounds. <laughs> um, there's, I have no idea where the actual TV stand part that would like connect to the bottom is. And most like, like off-the-shelf TV stands that are like universal TV stands that can like hook into the brackets you put in the back of a TV to wall mount them. Most of those that I looked at uh, earlier today all say it's like... Oh, we support TV up to 80 pounds because nobody makes a 110 pound TV. You could buy an 80 inch screen TV and it still wouldn't be 100 pounds because that's fucking madness for modern TV dimensions. Um, but the TV does work. I was able to plug it in like it works. The, the, the image quality compared to my what was like five hundred dollar actual 55 inch so it is a three inch bigger screen is a significantly smaller tv in terms of its overall dimensions which is the like tcl roku 4k hdr tv i'm normally using that tv looks a million times better uh yeah, i think was, you and i have the same tv yes yeah literally literally 10 percent of the cost of, of right, this tv right. when uh, this other tv when it came out um, and I'm pretty sure, like, the reason why that TV was just left there unplugged is I don't even think that TV was the TV owned by the previous family that lived in this house. I'm pretty sure it was the family before the family that we bought this house from because the family we bought the house from had only been in the house for, like, four to five years before the dad got, like, a promotion or okay. something had to move. So I have a question. Is this, yeah. like, a Texas thing? Because I'm getting deja vu on the, the Rooster Teeth podcast years ago. Back uh -huh. when I like listened to it a lot, Bernie Burns, the founder of Rooster Teeth, had this exact scenario where he moved into a new house in Austin and there was a TV that he could not get rid of and everyone else on the podcast was making fun of him because they couldn't understand it until he finally took a video to show how it was like recessed into the wall and he had like no fucking choice. It was like this 720p massive tube TV from like, you know, 2005 and there was like nothing he could do about it. And I'm just laughing I'm like, is this like a thing people in Texas do? Because I've... I haven't ever bought a house in my life, but but like I've my parents have, and I have not seen like just TVs left on the wall. <laughs> like I do get the impression from some people I've talked to that it is like like wall mounting TVs. I think is way more popular in Texas than it is other places. I don't know mm. why. I think it's I think that there's some some of the the sizes of the houses or something like that. Um, but I I despise wall mounted TVs. Like, I just yeah. hate it. I think it's probably because, like, you know, I don't own a house, probably will never own a house with the way that, you know, shit works out for our generation. So, like, uh -huh. the concept of making such a permanent choice with your TV, because then also the other thing is you're not going to want that TV just, like, fused to your wall for all of eternity because eventually you're going to want a nicer TV because eventually TVs are going to look a lot better and have new features and stuff Sh like that. Sean, this is an old person thing. Like, this yeah. is... I had I tried to talk my my mom and and her husband out of like doing some wall mounting shit at their new house forever. 
because and they finally they did it because it's just that's what you do with the fucking house is you put it in your wall they had to like get a handyman to like cut a hole in the wall to recess the tv in and of course the problem is now the only thing you can hook up to that tv is like a little roku because there's no way to get in there and like hook stuff up so whenever like they're like oh can you show me this movie jonathan and i'm like I can, but it's on Blu-ray, and I can't hook up my Blu-ray player because even if I could get the HDMI in there, you don't have it near an electrical outlet because the electrical outlet is behind the TV, and I no human hand can get to it. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's just the most inconvenient way to set up a TV. And, like, the, the whole thing with the cables was weird because the cables to this TV were, like, being filtered through this, like, plastic, blue plastic rectangle that was also like cut into the wall that was constructed in such a way that it like it was like you had to it was like a fucking kindergartner block puzzle or something where you put the circle (laughs) through the circle hole where it's like all the cables there are holes that were like the basically the exact dimensions so there's one that was shaped like a power cable where you put the power cable through this had like three different sets of fucking composite cables the tv does have an hdmi output on it but this it's so old that they were using fucking composite um that's you know that's how fucking the ancient this thing is and so you could the i when i saw that i was like oh that's why i could rip these fucking cables through out through this the tv hole is because they're like jammed in this plastic thing that you have to very carefully and precisely <laughs> angle the cable in the exact right direction to be able to pull it straight out through this blue plastic thing that i ripped out of the wall and threw in the fucking trash when i was done now i need to either uh move one of the posters i have to cover that wall because now it's got like these giant screw holes and shit in it or eventually hire someone to deal with that But if there's anybody who is in Texas listening to this podcast that wants a 100-pound 1080p TV um, that doesn't have a TV stand um, and might not support most modern TV stands you could buy off the market, obviously you can't get, like, the original TV stand because it's a 15-year-old TV. If anyone wants it, you can fucking have it. I wouldn't charge you a dime if it would just, you know, what... I like how you say just, like, in the state of Texas, like, that's a normal drive, like... Yes. if yeah, the, the state of Texas, here. which is, you know, the size of, like, multiple European countries. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, now I have this giant fucking TV I need to deal with. My TV is is a weird thing where I have this, this TV stand I own. Honestly, one of the nicest things I own because I got it from a Best Buy where it was a sh- floor model. And they just wanted to get rid of it, so I got it for cheap. Um, it would have normally been many times more expensive. But it's this multi-tiered, like, nice, really solid wood thing. But what it has is on the back is it has a wall, a floating wall mount, but it's not on the wall. It's on the stand. So my TV, Mm. I have the benefits of wall mounting, which is that I can have a bigger TV than I could if it was on its feet on that stand. And then it's hanging and I can do some adjustments and stuff with it, but it doesn't at all touch my wall. It's just all attached to the stand. That's ideal. If you can find something like that, that's a really good way to mount a TV. Um, But yeah, I would... Like, the whole idea of, like, I don't know, what are you, like, just drilling giant fucking holes in my wall to put a TV stand up seems like such a horrible idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do anything to a TV that I cannot undo, right? Like, That's I don't great, want yes. to have to hire somebody to deal with this, where it's like, if there's a problem where it's like, oh, shit, like, the HDMI cable came loose, too bad I can't fix it because this thing is fused to the wall. Let me go call somebody to go drill through my wall so I can... Exactly. Unplug and replug in this HDMI cable. Make sure that it, the connection works now. And it's like, okay, can you seal everything back up? I'll call you again next month. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh man, I thought you were gonna say like there was a fucking coaxial cable in there that you had to, like unscrew. Because oh, there was, was a coaxial cable okay. in the. That was actually the only cable that was plugged into that TV. Still, was the coaxial cable. <laughs> everything else was unplugged, which does lead to the question of who was the person. However long ago, like, again, I'm almost positive it was the previous, previous owners of this house. Um, Who took the TV off the stand, which you need at least two people. Like, it is a big, heavy TV. Took the TV off the stand, unplugged every cable, including the power cable, other than the coaxial cable. You left that in because you're like, well, might as well leave that in. It wasn't plugged in on the other end. That end, it was unplugged from the wall. Um, But it was plugged in the TV. Um, all the other the cables are just like strewn. The other end are just strewn on the floor of that utility closet. Um, 
but you left that in, unplugged everything else, and then put the TV back on the stand and said, and, and not just put it back on the stand, then like angled the cables up so that they went like ran up the wall. So that way the TV squished them against the wall, just lodging them into the brackets of the wall mount, thus making it stuck and said, there we go. Fuck the people buying this house, I guess. Like, hope you'd have now you have to deal with this weird arcane puzzle um, that we have to now solve to take this TV off. It felt like I was playing like a fucking Resident Evil game and there was going to be like a secret code behind there and to solve the puzzle on how to remove this TV on the wall to get like the scorpion key or some horse shit. <laughs> that does sound like a torture thing from like Resident Evil 7. Yeah. Where, you know, they just like to, uh, there's like a Saw movie kind of thing. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah so well, that's been is, my morning. That has been our periodic segment. Sean and Jonathan talk about TVs. Um, it's a fairly rare segment, but it happens every so often. Yeah, I don't have anything that exciting to talk about. My stuff has been a little bit... I have not had a lot of time to watch Gundam Age because of school stuff and then also um, Genshin Impact, but I have watched watched five episodes from what we're... We, we actually don't have a ton of episodes for the next one. It's yeah. 21 overall. Um, but it's that's fun. I've been doing that. I, I have not done a ton of other stuff. I did get... Man, I'm so excited to watch it. I have not had time yet because it's a three-hour movie, but I did get Akira Kurosawa's Ron in mm. on 4K from the UK. The UK nice. now has a 4K set of that. That was the the 4K restoration was done in Japan with the original DP. Um, and it, it's I, I looked at it because Ron is one of the best movies ever made. Mm -hmm. It has never had a particular. Well, the original Criterion DVD is great, and the video quality for its time was, I'm sure, spectacular. Just you put that on a 4K TV now, it doesn't particularly hold up. Uh, and the Blu ray of that movie that came out in the U United States that Criterion didn't handle was terrible. So I'm excited about that. I've been getting a couple 4K movies in this summer that have been fun. You can follow me on Twitter, I talk about that kind of stuff. But that's I have not been doing a lot of stuff. I've been uh, playing Genshin for the podcast. And just uh, racing through all the all the new content. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Genshin Impact has definitely been the like the stuff. time absorber. Yeah, of this week. Yes. All right. Well, do you want to go ahead and talk about some news? Yeah. What's going on in the news, Jonathan? Well, why don't you kick us off here, Sean, and tell us about what happened at the Doctor Who panel? Because uh, this podcast used to talk about Doctor Who all the fucking time, uh, and then. Uh, the show was canceled, sadly, uh, after Peter Capaldi, uh, you know, he regenerated into Jodie Whittaker. It seemed really exciting. Uh, and then unceremoniously, the show just stopped being made, and there wasn't really a reason to talk about Doctor Who anymore. So we haven't for a couple of years, and it was sad. Um, um, you know, it's, that's the reality I choose to live in, though. But apparently yeah. there's been some news about new Doctor Who, Sean. Yes, yeah, so the only reason we're even able to talk about this news is because of all my TV problems, because this dropped um, at, like, 1.30, so it dropped a little bit after when we normally would have... Uh, done this podcast basically um there is a teaser trailer for season series 13 um of doctor who there have been rumors that this is going to be the last series with jodie whittaker like that has not been confirmed this would be her third series or they, the specific rumors are they do this series and like a couple of specials and that would be it I have no idea if that's accurate none of that was talked about here um but so what this is is a small teaser trailer. The teaser trailer, like, is very nothing. It's like a bunch of close-ups on the actors. Um, Jodie Whittaker, the actress who plays Yaz, who has stuck around. Um, Ryan and Graham left at the end of the last New Year's special or whatever that was. Um, and there's, like, a new guy who's, like, a new uh, extra companion because they just can't, you know... Because you can't have Yaz be the only companion in an episode of Doctor Who because you'd have to actually write a character for her. Yeah, Chris um, Chimel would have to that. put in the effort to write a character for someone who's not a white man. That would be yes. really hard for him. Yes, because the other companion is an older white dude. Uh, just, you know, you needed to fill your Graham quota, so you lost the old white man who is your POV character and secretly the main character um, of new Doctor Who, and then they had to get a new older white dude on it. Um, so the teaser trailer tells you nothing. I mean, so much it tells you nothing that it doesn't even have the date for when the new season premieres. It just says later this year, which I think is like a weird, like anticlimactic kind of thing when there's not that much of the year left overall in terms of you. It's not like this is January 1st and you're teasing some point of the course of the next year. It's like, well, it's going to have to be in the fucking fall. It's going to be like August or September. Like it's got to be right. Um, the, but the main piece of news that is actually I think something that you can kind of talk about is that they said that the way they're structuring this series is that it is all one story. Obviously, it's going to be split up into multiple episodes, but the way they talked about it made it seem like it is like going to be more in a heavily serialized TV format. I like guessing just based off of the Chris Chibnall connection that it like structured like you would a Broadchurch or something, right? It's that sort of more modern miniseries type 
um, TV episode construction seems to be what they're going for. Um, I mean, they didn't give a lot of specific details, but that's that's that seems to be the overall pitch for what I'm sure is going to be a very bad season of Doctor Who based on the past two seasons. Oh, the, which you only watched one of them because you're smart. I watched both series 11 and series 12. Both Although, have you trash. seen the last episode that aired? Like, wasn't there a New Year's special where the companions left? No, I did not actually watch that yet. I, okay. I, I bought it on Amazon and then I never... Actually, I never brought myself around to actually watch it because it's like because that's right when the the winter semester started. I was like, do I really want to? I'm dealing with like going back to work and dealing with COVID stuff again. Do I really want to like spend the mental energy to watch this episode of Doctor Who that's going to be bad? Um, so yeah, I only I I saw that the companions left, but I didn't actually watch the episode yet. Yeah, I mean, we because we reviewed series eleven week to week, yep. and then we and then the last one I saw or talked about was the series eleven special with the Dalek that was terrible. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't have to specify they're all terrible in the Chibnall era because it's all bad. Um, and then you saw series twelve, and there is an episode of the podcast where it's actually a longer review than I remembered. It's the whole episode where you talk through series twelve. So I feel like I've seen it because you talked about all of it. Yes, um, that's the one but, where they do the timeless child bullshit in the finale and like try to completely retcon most of like the deep lore of doctor who in a way that is almost certainly just going to be thrown away when either by chibnall himself or whoever takes over for chibnall it has to it has to you literally doctor who can't continue if you don't um yes because it would be it would have to be a very different i mean which wouldn't be doctor who yeah um the way they've set it up um it's it's so bad i it's it's something where I, I it's hard for me to even think about it because it's so painful like what happened to that show of like it, it was such a promising idea and new era of you know making the switch and having a woman play the doctor for the first time and like we're gonna have a new writer and Stephen Moffat had been on for a really long time and you and I love Stephen Moffat but you know it was time for a new blood and then just man Chris Chibnall drove that show into the fucking ground like uh, like to the degree where it almost felt on purpose. Uh-huh. But what you know, probably not. But like, man, just just the worst. Every everything was bad. It will continue to be bad. This new season, I think, is like only seven episodes, right? Mm-hmm. Because of yeah. COVID stuff too. So we'll see. It, it's going to be bad. And then hopefully, hopefully they all leave and someone new can work with it. Although honestly, this se- this run has also like tanked Doctor Who's ratings to a point where I'm not sure what the BBC's overall investment in it is, especially because they're only getting seasons made every two years. Yeah. And, like, this time, I guess, COVID happened, which probably delayed things, but it was already going to be a two-year gap because Chris Chibnall, he can't possibly write more than ten episodes in a year. No one's ever done that. Um, you have It takes two years to do this <laughs> for some fucking reason. Yeah. Yeah. No. Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. I think the idea of doing your big serialized season of Doctor Who is probably very bad like especially when you're when you're Chris Chibnall and so like the only thing that like is your saving grace in series uh 11 and 12 is that occasionally you get an episode that's not just utter horseshit because it's written by someone who's like decent right so like Demons of the Punjab in series 11 is a decent episode of Doctor Who there's the um there's like there's one or two in series 12 that are like fine that are not you know amazing episodes but they're like decent there's the one that's like the Mary Shelley one in series 12 that's like probably the best one in this era it's like decent it would be like an average episode of doctor who in another season which makes it like a gem for this era but those only happen because those are have like very little of like the chibnallness on them it's only like you know the setup is bad because the character setups are bad so there's only so much a good writer could do in the show anyways but you could still get a decent one-off episode if you're doing something heavily serialized um that then I think kind of removes the ability for an individual episode to be something you could enjoy removed from the rest of the stuff around it in the way that someone could just watch Demons of the Punjab or that Mary Shelley episode and enjoy them under themselves. If you lose that aspect for Doctor Who, um, you're making a mistake. I am curious if it will actually be like a heavily serialized like TV miniseries kind of thing or if it will be more like the keys to time or uh-huh. even Doctor Who series 6 the the Moffat season where every episode had some thing sprinkled on it about the overall arc that year but there were plenty of like standalone episodes and basically Moffat came in and like added a minute to the end of different individual episodes to like continuity tie them I'm 
I don't know. Because, like, I, I feel like the actual, like, work of doing a serialized story over eight episodes is more work than Chibnall would do. So that's that's kind of why I feel like maybe this is just posturing, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, you won't. Uh, <laughs> no, I won't. I'm not. I'm not fucking watching it. I, I'm. I will watch it. Like that will be when I watch the New Year's Eve one. Like, there's no way I'm not going to watch it again. I've seen everything of Doctor Who. Like, I can. I can make the commitment to watch eight more bad episodes of Doctor Who. I got through series twelve. Um, but yeah, but you're smarter, so I'll. I'll <laughs> sure I'll talk about it any year or so on the podcast. Tell you what, Sean, you, when you watch that, I'll go watch the next Tom Baker season where I left off in Classic Who. And just one of us will have a great time and one of us will have <laughs> yeah. a very bad time. Yeah, because God, I mean, in in retrospect, like the last Tom Baker season, which is easily his worst, like that has an episode called Megalos, which is like an infamously bad episode of Doctor Who. I, I could go for a season of eight Megalosses at this point uh, with Doctor <laughs> Who where it's at right now. Oh, please. Well, speaking of stuff that's good, um, I, I don't know why I said speaking of. Like, I, yeah. what I meant is let's talk about something that is good. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Dragon Ball had a panel yesterday where uh, at San Diego Comic Con. Well, it was the, like Comic Con online. I think yes. they filmed this in Japan. Um, where they announced Dragon Ball Super Super Hero, the new movie we knew was being made, but we got a title. It is called Dragon Ball Super Super Hero. Um, the panel, uh, did you watch the panel, Sean? No, I watched, like, the little kind of teaser thing they put out that had, like, Goku doing some kung fu shit, um, but I didn't see the panel itself. Yeah, uh, I did watch the panel, and it is very entertaining. It started with Hironobu Kageyama, the singer of all the classic Dragon mm-hmm. Ball themes, came on and did karaoke chala head chala like and i don't i'm not joking i'm pretty sure it was the karaoke mix which like i have in my itunes library of chala head chala and he just sang along with it and even like the visuals behind him looked like the visuals you would get in a japanese like karaoke bar um so it was kind of funny but hironobu kageyama is just he is charismatic enough and good Uh enough a singer to pull that off and it was very entertaining so if you haven't seen that the first three minutes of it are fun because it's just him doing karaoke to his own song which is fun and then uh we brought out the panel which was masako nozawa was there the voice of goku um the shueisha editor uh akio yoku was there and then the toei animation producer norihiro hayashida was there he he produced the parts of the show and then the broly movie and then he's producing this new movie so those are the people who were on stage they talked about a lot of different things they talked about some redesigns they showed off some art it was mostly sort of like marketing pep talk kind of stuff they couldn't say a lot of like specifics and the little teaser they showed was just a it was actually an animation from the broly movie of goku in this stance where he's kind of like almost like in a boxing stance kind Mm -hmm. of like jumping around which is in the broly movie but it was in sort of a new animation style we'll talk about that in a second um they showed off some character designs the 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 biggest change for me this is the biggest news the whole thing for me is that piccolo his color scheme has been changed in the new movie to reflect his color scheme from the manga, Whoa. which is different. A lot of people don't know this. Piccolo in the show, the like bulbous parts of his arms are pink. In the manga, those are yellow. Mm-hmm. And so he is now, he has his proper yellow arms for the first time in any Dragon Ball anime. Uh, K- uh, Krillin has, for the first time ever, I think his eyes are also more of his. Yeah, he has bigger eyes with more white. He has usually been drawn with just sort of black pupils in the anime, but that's not quite how he's drawn in the manga. They showed off uh, Piccolo's house, which we've never seen. Apparently that's in this movie. They showed off a little piece of concept art of Piccolo's house. It's just a Namekian house. Um, There should be like a secret room in Piccolo's house where he has all these pictures of Gohan's like high school graduation (laughs) and then hanging out like in the wastelands where Gohan has his little sword. It's just his little Gohan room. There's like a trophy from Gohan winning the baseball game at his high school. Yes, exactly. Uh, A newspaper about great Saiyaman saves the day. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I would love that. Um, that should be the opening of the movie is like it in that room, like going over all this stuff. And you think it's going to pan over and it's like Gohan and it pans over. and It's just like Piccolo standing there admiring his his son. Yes. And then finally they showed an original character design, which is like a, a an alien dude in a cape. 
He looked cool. Um, this is all Toriyama art. Uh, the best moment of the entire panel for me is when they reveal the title and then the MC goes around to the panel and asks them questions, but he didn't really have a question for Masako Nozawa there, because what do you ask the voice of Goku? Is this the title of the movie? You know, and basically he just said to her, he's like, so, that's the title of the movie. And she thinks for a second, and you can see the wheel spinning of like, I don't have anything I can say here. And so she goes, Mo, sono... Tori this, <laughs> which just means yes, it is the title, yes. and she says it like very emphatically, <laughs> like I like the pro voice actor she is, mm -hmm. and it's fucking hilarious. Um, but of course, the real news is we have the title of the movie. It's Dragon Ball Super Superhero, not Dragon Ball Superhero, Dragon Ball Super Superhero, um, which means maybe we'll get Super Dragon Ball Heroes Super Superhero at some point. Yes, because it should be noted that Dragon Ball Heroes is a thing that's the like arcade card game thing yes. in japan um that has had some home releases uh, even over here but this is not that this is this is a dragon ball super movie presumably with no connection to dragon ball heroes like maybe there's like some time xeno bullshit that happens um but i think all implications are just no nope, this is just dragon ball super superhero well, um, it, it's not going to have any connection to heroes because Toriyama wrote this, and I don't think he knows yes. anything about Dragon Ball Heroes. No, well, you know, we're finally going to get Super Saiyan 7, seven like, crazy Broly fused with Vegito or some shit. Brolito, <laughs> um, Super Saiyan 7, um, which I think they're they're about to get there in Dragon Ball Heroes. For people who don't know, if you've seen a million crazy, weird fusions and like transformations and shit like that from Dragon Ball characters that don't make any sense. That's where that come from. Because you got to fuel content for this arcade game somehow. Um, but yes, this just seems to be, you know, we got to come up with a cool title for our movie. What's really hot right now, superheroes? We've got a superhero in Dragon Ball. It's great, Saiyan Man. Goku's kind of superhero-esque. He's got superpowers. He's very heroic. So Dragon Ball Super Superhero, I'm all here for it. There was a One Piece theme song a couple years ago called Super Powers, uh, which is great. It's, yes, we got the super powers. I feel like they should have saved that uh -huh. for Dragon Ball Super Superhero. It worked in One Piece just fine, but it would be more fun for Dragon Ball Super Superhero. You know, we still don't know anything about the story. I think, I feel like getting that concept art kind of confirms this is not going to be based on like yeah. any of the manga stuff, um, which makes sense because they also said... Um, during the, like the main thing that the two producers tried to stress over and over during the panel is that Toriyama is very involved with this, we promise. Um, and, which makes sense. He has been increasingly involved since the Battle of Gods movie, where Battle of Gods, he didn't write the first draft, but then he saw the script and was like, hey, let me revise that, and he basically rewrote the whole thing, and then he started writing the scripts fresh for Resurrection F, and then the Broly movie, um, and apparently he started writing this script during production of Broly. Once his work was mm. done and they were making the movie, he just went off and started writing another movie, um, is what they said. And they said he's, he's very involved in this. I think the big fan question and controversy coming out of this panel is, what is the animation style going to be? Because that little tiny teaser they gave seemed to indicate a more CGI direction. The trailer was, the, the Goku model was very clearly CGI with some mm -hmm. cell shading on it. Um, and they kept saying there's a new animation style, but they didn't say anything about it. And I think I would be very disappointed if they didn't just do what they did in the Broly movie, because that was perfect. But, you know, I, I also, I don't know what they're doing, so I'm not going to judge anything yet. I mean, there was a lot of that CGI stuff in the Broly movie also, right? Like, like the whole industry is trending towards, the, like, the UFO table style yeah. that enables that kind of 3d camera movement so yeah i wouldn't be like you know it, uh, i i'm very optimistic that i think they're going to do a good job with that stuff um I, yeah I, I just it's it's the the character model itself didn't look like a normal anime 2d drawing was mm -hmm. the, the whole idea and like i the the like the the new character designer they had in broly i just he, it's the best like character yes. design work i think dragon ball has had since the Earliest days when you had Mamoru uh, Miyata, uh, I'm forgetting his name, Ma Mamoru Maeda, I think is his name, was the first character designer who did all of Dr. Slump and then all of Dragon Ball up through early, all, up through like the Frieza arc, like when Goku goes Super Saiyan. Um, and like he probably had the best sense of like Toriyama's artwork. And then I think the people who came after that, very good as well. But I think the, the Broly movie really reinvigorated that, mm -hmm. that art style and like bringing Toriyama's art to life. But it does seem like they have a, a sense of like trying to bring like like they showed off like different things from the manga they're doing for the first time in the anime. So you know I will wait until we see actual footage to judge anything. 
but I'm excited there's a new Dragon Ball movie. Yes, yeah, it's something I think we've just been waiting for for a long time because Broly was so good. I'm curious to see if Broly shows up in this um, because I would, you know, I, I, I don't think he has to, but I would be very interested to see more with that character because they did such a good job with him. Um, that, that was always kind of my hope for a Dragon Ball Super Season 2 or something if they did a TV show is that, like, Broly would become a major character in that. Um, so I'd be curious to see if they're... Especially if Toriyama started writing the script like w around the same time with all the Burly stuff was happening, maybe that means that it, it was still fresh in his head. Well, because the that first like three movies all kind of build. You have Beerus mm -hmm. and Whis are in the next two very heavily. Frieza is then in the Broly movie very heavily. Um, so it would make sense for Broly to continue into the next one, you know. Yeah. Then so. hopefully they used if they do, then they need to bring back that sick ass musical theme he had. Because I yeah. still, that, like, but um but um I still, that, like, will, like, pop up in my head when, like, something very cool happens in something I'm watching. I'm like, man, why doesn't this have that good music sting that fucking <laughs> Super Broly had? Because that was sick. No, that, the score for Broly is great. It's yeah. definitely the best thing that uh, that composer has done for Dragon Ball. So, exciting stuff. And one day, maybe Dragon Ball Super Season 2. I really want to see Dragon Ball Super Season 2 because... Toei's animation for TV stuff has gotten so much better mm -hmm. since Super went off the air. If you've been following One Piece or the Dragon Quest anime they're doing, like they have clearly gotten a lot of their shit together in a way that's very compelling, and it would be really cool to see that applied to Dragon Ball. So we'll see. They're they're busy with a lot of stuff, but um, I'm I'm curious where this all goes. So that's the fun news, Sean. Uh -huh. mm. You want to talk about the less fun news? Yeah. What the fuck is the game industry been doing this time, Jonathan? Activision Blizzard is being sued by the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing over, quote, this is from the Kotaku write-up, a frat boy workplace culture that it alleges has led to years of harassment and abuse targeting the women in its workforce. Let me read a couple of the complaints. This is, these are quotes from the uh, complaint that the department filed. In the office, women are subjected to cube crawls in which male employees drink copious amounts of alcohol as they crawl their way towards various cubicles and often engage in inappropriate behavior towards female employees. Male employees proudly come into work hungover, play games for long periods of time during work while delegating their responsibilities to female employees, engage in banter about sexual encounter, talk openly about female bodies, and joke about rape. Female employees are subjected to constant harassment, uh, sexual harassment, including having to continually fend off unwanted sexual advances and comments. Uh, High-ranking executives and creators engaged in blatant sexual harassment without repercussion. In a particularly tragic example, a female employee, um, trigger warning here, uh, suicide, uh, committed suicide during a business trip with a male supervisor who had brought butt plugs and lubricant with him on the trip. Uh, also uh, highlighted were situations where female employees were treated negatively due to pregnancies. Um, including women who were penalized for taking maternity leave, uh, criticized for having to pick up children from daycare while male counterparts were playing games at work, not the games they were working on. Um, female employees were kicked out of lactation rooms so employees could use the rooms for meetings. Uh, an African-American employee noted that it took her two years to be made into a permanent employee while men hired after her were made permanent employees. She was micromanaged to such a degree that her male co-workers were known to be playing video games without any intervention by her supervisor, but her supervisor would call and check on her if she took a break to go on a walk. Uh, it goes on and on, and then Activision Blizzard uh, basically took the fuck all these bitches, they're crazy approach to responding to this, where they did a long extremely offensive response basically saying that all these women are liars like the donald trump response of like all these mm -hmm. women lied and i'm gonna sue them all um it's very bad um it's it's just disappointing and then th that was like with one hand and then on the other hand they put out like a public statement saying oh we're sorry we'll try to do better and they won't they won't they're all liars um this is really this is really depressing sean um i don't i don't quite know what to say other than I felt like it should be acknowledged and brought up on this podcast because we have talked about this overall string of news over the years, you know, um, of, of uh, you know, sort of the, the Me Too movement and some of those changes coming into the gaming industry. And this is, this is a big moment because this is not just like employees coming forward and saying stuff. This is the, again, California Department of Fair Employment yeah. uh, suing them for um, remuneration. Yeah, it's it is uh, a pretty huge, like, 
you know, it, it, it is a very different context because it's not like sexual assault or harassment and that kind of stuff. But it's, it is not too dissimilar from like the whole 38 Studios thing we talked about with Jason Schreier's book or that's Rhode Island. Um, but like getting involved with like this is a like government body having to directly intervene with the operations of a video game of like a major, major. I mean, one of the biggest um, video game publishers and development houses in the world um it's pretty crazy and yeah the this is one where like i didn't like read all the way through the report when it originally came out just because like this is fucking depressing as shit especially when it's like you know it's only been about a year now since this kind of stuff was coming out with ubisoft and the like deep entrenched amount of harassment and misbehavior by um upper management at ubisoft um that reach every fucking aspect of that company all that shit came out about a year, a year plus ago. Um, and so having what is, especially like in the West, like two of the three huge video game publishers that aren't a like hardware manufacturer, right? You've got Activision, EA, and Ubisoft. We have two of the three now like involved in legal matters around this shit. It's not just um, you hearing rumors or something or there being like scuttlebutt out there that there's some bad shit going on. This is like out in the open being investigated and prosecuted. Um, it's crazy. Like it's 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 not necessarily something that is... Um, it, it, it both does feel surprising and doesn't feel surprising. It's that kind of thing where like you always get the sense that like this is these are such deeply entrenched problems that it is almost certainly happening. But I think this like like what we talked with Ubisoft. It is one thing to kind of get a sense that probably this kind of stuff is going on and another to like be exposed to it directly and have it like in your face and sort of see the reality of it um, is very frustrating and disappointing. It makes it, you know, hard to be excited about fucking Call of Duty or whatever shit, you know, um, coming out. Uh, it is... It fucking sucks. Um, but like we talked about with the Ubisoft thing, like the one thing you can take from this is that this is a sign that things are getting better, right? That like, that's always the thing I like to think about or like the perspective I like to have with this stuff is that you when, when you know about the awful shit that's happening and it's getting out in the open and people are trying to do something about it, that is a sign that things are getting better because it has been like that at Activision Blizzard for decades, right? Um, and it has been something that, like, there hasn't been any sort of pressure to try to force some change. So, like, this should be, I mean, this is, like, fucking huge. Like, this should be a significant amount of pressure to, like, get Bobby Kotick and everyone else in the management at Activision to take this shit seriously and actually try to change it, whether that means like uh, not firing. take it seriously, they resign. Yes. I don't yes. not no. a single I mean, they person yes. in leadership at that company should be working there one fucking day longer. There is no we've seen that from Ubisoft. The Ubisoft yeah. example from the last year of like they made all these like nominal changes, but then all the people who were in charge of all of it are still there. That was some of the controversy around the Assassin's Creed Infinity uh -huh. announcement a couple weeks ago, is that all the people in leadership there were people in leadership when that shit was going on at Ubisoft. And so Ubisoft, if you haven't seen the news, is hemorrhaging talent right now. Like, they cannot keep their staff because, and it's a couple of reasons, part of it being that other tech companies like Microsoft are expanding in Canada in the areas where they're working and they pay better than Ubisoft does. But also, Microsoft doesn't have, like, a flaming fucking, like, um, you know, arrow pointing at it of, like, we're shitty about everything as Ubisoft does, and Ubisoft hasn't replaced the people in charge of that. Yves Guimont is still there, and yep. he's not going anywhere because he is the company, and he knew about every fucking inch of it. I don't care what he says. He's a liar, and they all know it, and that's why the employees are leaving. Yeah, it's the kind of thing where, yes, if, if like, the company itself doesn't take measures to, like, significantly like rem like cut out the the people there that are causing this to happen like this is the thing that then needs to happen is you know anybody who then is like looking for a job at some place is going to do your like basic googling hey like is this a good place to work like what has happened here all that kind of shit or like if you're interested in the game industry this is high profile enough that like no matter who you are you probably like are getting wind of this kind of shit and yes i think it uh these companies need to feel the consequences of what the fuck they've been doing. Um, and, you know, in a, in a much better world, it would be something where people had um, the amount of, like, self-awareness and self-respect to do it themselves um, the, at the company rather than, like, 
intervening bodies and people having to sort of like suffocate the company um, by cutting off its revenue sources or its means of employment. And I and I want to point out, like some people at Blizzard have have said the some of the right things in like some of their statements about like this is terrible. The people within power though at Blizzard are utterly like unrepentant about this. Mm-hmm. Like basically not not necessarily like saying all this conduct is good, but like saying fake news, like basically the yeah. Trump approach to it. Like I mean, the official Blizzard response to uh, Activision Blizzard response to the DFEH lawsuit is this long screed about how much like they hate the government basically like it like there's this one sentence in here where it says this is the type of irresponsible behavior from unaccountable state bureaucrats that are driving many of the state's best businesses out of California like just completely trying to push it off on someone else just not taking any amount of like introspection or responsibility and if you read the full statement you will see it's a little bit at the top and the bottom about how discrimination is bad and we comply with this this and this but nothing about like what we're going to do what we're going to change what they're saying is we're already fine and it's the government that's bad that's their official stance um let's see blizzard president j allen brack sent out an email where he he said like you know he's very saddened about all of this but then basically just spends the whole thing talking about what a great feminist he is up to and including a long very weird paragraph where he name drops gloria steinem as a hero in his household and how he's tried to like live by her tenants as if she's jesus or something um very bizarre it's, it's I, the it's the like hey i have a daughter like approach yeah. to it's like i can't be bad I like women, though. Like yeah, I it's have worse. a worse. It's like she he Googled who's yeah. a feminist, got Gloria Steinem, and said, "Okay, we'll put her in the email." Um, but the the one of the executives, uh, Activision Blizzard executive Fran Townshend, who was the Homeland Security Advisor to George W. Bush from 2004 to 2007 and joined Activision this year, sent out a very different email um, that Jason Schreier reports has uh, employees, quote, fuming, where it's basically just, a, it's just it's the exact same thing as the official statement, which is like, we have no problems, um, we, we've done this, this, and this, we've, we have diversity training, we have an employee relations team dedicated to investigating employee concerns, we've amplified internal programs like this and this, blah, 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 we're great, we're fine, we, we work at a company that tr- truly values equality and fairness is what they're saying and and it's just like complete unrepentance um from the people who matter at this and like you know uh, it's it's so depressing like at least the fucking ubisoft people pretended yeah i mean it's it's a thing where like you know i don't want to present unions as being a panacea like it's not going to it can't solve every single problem but like this is one of the places where because these places aren't unionized like there is no like official level of worker organization that they can get behind like the people working at these companies don't have a tool to fight against this stuff right because if if the like activision's response is well we have diversity training and we've got an hr team it's like but there's no force that the employees can take to tell you that that shit's not working because human resources like hr especially when there's no union side to it has no teeth for the worker it has teeth for the company because the hr is there for the company yes. it's not there for the employee yes yeah. um and and again like union stuff can fix that like i have now a lot more experience about this than the last time we've talked about this kind of shit on the podcast because i was part of a union for two years with the teacher stuff and there was a lot of bullshit that happened around covid and it's not like the union was able to fix all of it because the district i worked at uh sucked and also had uh, a temporary superintendent for most of my time there, and then a new superintendent that, based on some of the emails I'm still getting, negotiations are not going well. Um, you know, I I hope those teachers enjoy the one percent pity raise that they're fucking getting from that district. Fucking horseshit. Um, but like, there is a lot of stuff that happened that was rough. Um, at my time at where I previously worked, that like. I could see very directly and experience very directly the benefits of unionizing through like having intermediaries that were actually like independent and weren't just bought um, by uh, the people that you work for. And a lot of that stuff was enabled because the union was there to like ensure that that's how it worked um, and that there was some sort of power or leverage that that if it didn't work that way, you had some way to fight back. And that kind of helps keep things in check. 
Um, so again, it's uh, unions are, can't solve all problems, but it is a like really invaluable tool that you must have some amount of leverage to be able to wield against these companies. And because it is nearly unheard of in the video game industry, you then have to rely on something like this, like it going to the fucking state government to try to find some level of intervention. And the uh, the upper management at Activision and Ubisoft, like they don't need to make any change or doesn't feel like they seem to feel any pressure to make any change according to all that shit, like this kind of internal memos at Activision. Um, it's really frustrating. And it's the thing that it's like, it's just something like massive needs to happen within the industry to fix these problems yeah as you say unions are not a panacea but they are a necessary condition for change it's, it's yes. one of those things where it's like unions themselves are not a magic bullet but nothing major good can really happen without it it is a necessary precondition you know and i am mm -hmm. also a member of a union i'm a member of uh uh cogs is our union at the university of iowa for graduate students it's one of the best in the country and it's very important because that's how i have health care that's how i have a salary yeah. um a lot of you know um especially in an era where schools are just gutting funding left and right because the government is gutting funding left and right you know it's very important that my school has a union because it's what allows me to work and live and be able to do this um and it's still difficult and we have a lot of challenges because Iowa is a really heavily anti-union state now because of Republicans. Um, but like, you know, it is a necessary precondition for my livelihood. Um, and it, it's, it's an important thing that needs to be brought back into, into public view and, and it would be a great place for video games. And, and, you know, if Blizzard actually wanted to change anything, one thing it could say is, we would support the workers unionizing or something, mm -hmm. you know, but they're not going to do that. They don't want it. They, they, like, that's the thing is like, yeah, I, I really like, I don't give one single solitary shit. What Ubisoft says about any of their problems until people high up are quitting. Yeah. I don't give one single solitary shit about what Blizzard says until people high up are quitting. Because if you have worked somewhere and you have overseen this stuff you can tell me until you are blue in the face. I didn't know, and I'm appalled. Well, there's two explanations for that. One, you're a fucking liar. Or two, you're so horrible at your job, you didn't know that your employees were being abused. And as a manager, that is your job to know yeah. it. And I'm actually not sure which one of those explanations is worse. Because at least if you're a fucking liar, I know where you stand. Yeah, 100%. so that's that's that. All right, you want to talk about a good video game? Yes, let's talk about something that is fun and good and happy, um, which is motherfucking Genshin Impact. And is made in the mysterious land of China, so we have no idea what the labor conditions yes. are in MiHoYo. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what it's like to work in MiHoYo. It seems like they're having fun. It's a very fun game. It feels like they are making the exact fucking video game they want to make uh, because yes. they they are making <laughs> Genshin Impact is slowly becoming like the one video game to rule them all. Um, it's becoming it is, the Ur video game. Yes. I mean, it's that thing where... I th there's some stuff about, like... Particularly when they added the Serenity Pot, which is their, like, player housing system, um, which they've now added um, farming to as well. It's oh not like... God. Yeah, there's not, like, a lot of mechanics around it. It's more just, like, you can buy seeds, and you, it's, like, one additional method for you to kind of get um player like character ascension materials and stuff like that like if you need lamp grass if you're making deluke or something you can plant those and get some extra that way um but like that like adding the boat adding the like um hangout events all of that which is all stuff that's before this 2.0 update but like some of the major things they've been adding to the game over the months um that are not just new pieces of content but are new kinds of content and new ways to interact with the game, new ways to interact with the characters, new ways to like just be in the world of Genshin Impact. Like it makes me think about when new No Man's Sky came out and there was a lot of talk about like the one true game, right? Like the eternal game, <laughs> like the game that's like, like the thing that people are looking for or some people are looking for is like the one game that you can play forever and never get bored of. And that was like part of the backlash for No Man's Sky was that like, that is very much not what No Man's Sky certainly was at launch. Like, maybe it has some aspect of that now with, like, the deep level support it's had. But, like, it's that thing where you're chasing a dragon that will probably never be fulfilled because there's no game that can be, like, the eternal game to you. 
and then Genshin Impact comes out and Genshin Impact says, but what if we, you can? Like, what if you just need to make it good enough and anime enough and dope enough <laughs> to just be like the only video game you ever need to play? And that's kind of what it feels like. It's definitely getting there. It's, I mean, honestly, that's the biggest reason I, I had to pull myself away from it for a little while this year was just so I had time to do other stuff. Play mm -hmm. other games, watch other, watch movies and read books and stuff. Because it is, it's a real time suck if you let it be. But, you know, I think, we've talked about this before too, it's it's kind of as much of a game as you want it to be. Yes. It can be your all the time thing, or it can be your, I'll check in when there's a new Archon quest and, and just do the main story. And you will have a good time either way. Sean, you are very much an everyday kind of person with Genshin Impact. Yeah, it's, it very much has, like, taken over. I mean, I should say, like, I mean, I don't play... Um, Dragon Ball Legends has, like, fallen off my cycle at this point because that game has kind of, I think, mostly run its course. Um, and, and, like, Genshin Impact has, like, taken up that time. Like, Genshin Impact is the thing that, like, I wake up in the morning... I get like a, a glass of water. Um, I kind of sit down, relax a little bit. And like, you know, some people read the newspaper if you're like 60 years old. I play 15 minutes of Genshin Impact and do like my daily commissions. Like it's the thing I do when I wake up um, that is just like, I kind of like relax a little bit. Or when I was working, it was the thing I did when I came home from work. And I like, I kind of decompressed because it's this is like really fun, nice, familiar thing that you can just do your daily commissions, do some quick stuff with your resin, play for 15, 30 minutes, and you have all of these great, like, big long-term goals in terms of the characters you're making and the artifacts your sets you're, you're doing and all of that, like, that you can do a little bit every day and make that progress. Um, and it fits really nicely into your life in that way. But then also when you now have this massive update, you can then sit down and play it the way you would Zelda Breath of the Wild or a Skyrim or some other, like, Assassin's Creed, some huge open-world game where you just sit down and put hour after hour after hour into it just get completely lost in the world in the story in the characters in the vibes and the mood of the game and the fact that it can occupy both of those spaces is the thing that separates it from any other gacha game i've played every other gacha game i've played occupies the like you play a little bit everyday space and can some do them really well the ones that aren't good don't do that well um this game can can be both things and so it does have the sense of it is somehow able to be all things to all people in a way that i am like endlessly impressed at with its design yeah i mean i'll just say when i because i had missed the last couple months i hadn't really done any of the hangout quests or the serenity pot or the they added that new little area with some of the islands and stuff yes um whatever those were called the the and golden apple archipelago Yes, the golden apple. I, I, any question I can just ask Sean about Genshin yes. Impact, you you know all of it. Um, later we'll play the quiz. Name the voice actor, and you'll just go through every character in the game. And <laughs> you're not that off. Uh, I know yeah. I'm not that off. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but like, and I was sort of because I, I was a little worried because the I've never really gotten into any kind of long term game like this. Mm -hmm. I've never played gotcha games. The, I've never really gotten into an MMO. The closest would be Destiny, and Destiny eventually drove me away because Destiny 2 went so hard into the, like, World of Warcraft, mm -hmm. Elder Scrolls Online. This is for the committed and absolutely no one else. Um, and so it really drove me away. And I was a little worried because sometimes with those kinds of games, you come back and then it's just impenetrable because you've missed too much. And it, no, Genshin Impact, like, I, I can go back and catch up on anything I want, but, like, it wasn't like there was this big barrier for me jumping back in with, like, the 2.0 stuff. Or I started playing a couple days before 2.0 to just clean up a couple of things. And, like, mm -hmm. I they had added one big section of the Archon quest and then the prologue for Chapter 2. And so I did those. And I did um, a little of the... I did some of the stuff in the Golden Apple Archipelago because there were some good rewards for that. Um, and that was fun. And, like, and that was fine. And then 2.0 started and I was off to the races. And I still have some stuff on my quest list from, like, different character quests I've accepted that I need to go back and play at some point but it's not like there's a giant like flashing indicator mm -hmm. on me at all times of like you have to go do this um it's much more gentle than that and so overall it's yeah it it works very well but I want to back up here okay and just like let's recap really quick you started playing Genshin Impact basically at launch right um I can say specifically I started playing it on October 4th which is a week after launch because I was looking at the character archive thing the other day and i noticed that it actually tells you when you unlocked certain characters and out of curiosity i went down and i saw that that is when i started playing 
I maybe I actually started on October third. I think I maybe played a little bit on a day where I like just kind of checked it out before I unlocked the gotcha side of it. Um, but that was where I confirmed what I did remember was that I did get Chi Chi, that five star character, on my first ever pull because I that you have I, been so it's so weird. You have the weirdest luck. With I this have I have I mean I have almost every character in the game. Um, without spending like I I do my five dollar thing. I've bought the weapon thing a couple of times, um, but I have just been very, I have both been very lucky. And I do think the game, like if you do your little bit every single day, like you get enough rolls that combined with the pity system, it's really not that hard to get. No, it's not. Yeah. Most of the characters you want, like you have to put in that time of like doing the daily grind to get the, the currency, but the game compared to certainly fake grand order, it is much more generous than that game is. It's not as generous as dragon ball legends, but in some ways it's almost kind of, better because dragon ball legends it's almost like too easy to get free currency and to get the characters that it almost makes that side of the game eventually feel kind of like tedious because i have like 200 fucking characters in that game so getting a new character is doesn't feel significant whereas in genshin impact getting like when i got ayaka two nights ago that was like holy shit i can't like i have this character now um i did get her on a pity roll so like i was pretty sure i'd probably get her um but it was like a man this is huge to be able to get this character and and to be able to play the game in that way and still feel like the gotcha system is not working against me in the way that when i play fake grand order which is a game that i also like a lot and i continue to do a little bit of um that game you don't need to do daily grind as much it's more like weekly rewards so that game's easier to do in little spurts every couple of days um but that game like the gotcha is one you have to wait for a character that you really want and only ever spend character on like the one or two banners a year that you're actually interested in. Whereas like Genshin Impact, I roll on every single banner and I've gotten most of the characters. There's like three or four that I don't have, um, but most of the characters I really wanted I ended up getting, which feels great. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way to put it. I, I have to imagine that part of this game's success is that it must be reliant less on like the whales than a lot of Genshin or than a lot of gacha games are. I'm sure there are the people who have spent ten thousand yes. dollars on Genshin Impact. But like you and I, the the main way we spend money on this game is if we're playing it a lot one month, we'll pay pie the like five dollar thing where it gives you ninety primo gems a day. And like I have no guilt about that because I I would have guilt if I gave yes. no money to this game because I've spent like two hundred hours of it. So if I'm gonna give five dollars and you actually get compared to any other gotcha game a lot for that five dollars, oh, yeah. I have to imagine. And because the gotcha system, as you say, works with you a little more, there must probably be more like equanimity in who's paying for it. I'd love to see some of those stats. We'll never see them, but that'd be interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think we I, we ended giving up a little off track I think because I went on my right. my tangent. So what, where did you want to start? Because you said so I Just started saying, like, like so you started in October. So yeah. you you but that was shortly after launch, right? Yes, that was like within a week after the launch okay. of the 1.0 of the game. Yeah, and I did not play it in 2020 because I did not start playing it until the top 10 games of 2020. It was your number one. So yes. It was your number game one game of the year. Uh, a decision I think you have only been vindicated on with every passing fucking day. Yeah, because at that point, I was a little bit sketchy on it because that was like Dragon Spine had just come out. You know, I had spent about a month playing it on the PS5 version. And I do think the PS5 version is what kind of... It wasn't the native PS5, but the PS4 version on PS5, which boosted up the frame rate to 60 and increased the loading speed. Um, that was what like kind of helped cement it as my number one because it was like, okay, now this game feels way better to play. Um, and that's where I started to feel more confident in, like, I really love the combat in Genshin Impact mm -hmm. as much as I love anything else. And that has only certainly proved more and more true where, like, th I think the game's combat and all that is so rich. Um, but, yeah, that's where, like, I was a little bit cagey on it in some ways because it was a thing where my opinions on the game had improved so much over the couple of months I had played it leading up to Game of the Year. And then since then... Like, it is easily the best game that came out in 2020. I mean, it's it's it would be probably in my top 10 games, like, of all time if we redid that list. Like, it is truly, I think it, it is, like, deserves to be in that conversation. And I'm pretty much in the same place, because uh, I started playing it shortly after that. I started playing it in January of this year. So at that point, we had all of the Mondstadt, Liyue, and then Dragonspine stuff. Yes, and that um, was when, like, Lantern Rite had just started, right? The Lantern Rite mm -hmm. Festival is around the time you started. I feel like the Lantern Rite stuff actually came pretty well because it was like while I was finishing up Leeway stuff. Mm -hmm. So like it all like it was a little after I started playing, but then it like dovetailed very nicely because the Lantern Rite stuff was like a little farewell to Leeway event. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, so so I did all. So I I actually the way I played it is I did Dragon Spine before I even went to Liyue, um, right. which was kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but anyway, um, so I did all of that, and and yeah, so it was not on my top ten last year. I will say it would be number one or two from twenty twenty for me. It would be that or Hades, which. It would still be very competitive with Hades. I would have to think about that. And they're very different games. They're yes. both games I put a lot of time into. But Hades is a roguelike with an actual ending um, at a certain point. And Genshin Impact will be with us for years to come. So yeah. it's a little bit of a different thing. But it would definitely... There, there's nothing else from last year. Like that. And then the ones below it would be stuff like Ori and the Will of the Wisps. And then Yakuza 7, which I caught up with this year. But none of that would, would quite be up on the level of Genshin Impact. And yeah, it's it's a game I love kind of the more I play it. Um, mm-hmm. But now I've played it very heavily. I think my PS5 play clock says it's like I'm over 150 hours with it. I'm sure you're well above that. Yes. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's the game I've played most of any game since... In the last couple of years, other than Breath of the Wild, which I think my play clock on my Switch is like 175 hours, so I might have passed that with Genshin and uh, Smash Bros. Ultimate, which is around that same level of uh, Breath of the Wild on my Switch. Yeah, the so, only other game, if you combined Hitman 2 and 3 with my playtime of Hitman 1, that would be, I think, the only thing in recent memory that would be like in the realm of Genshin Impact in right. terms of playtime for me. Yeah. So you and I have both played the shit out of it. At this point, we have... Like, you've, again, been playing a little longer, and you are a little more daily with it than I am. Although, when I'm in it, I'm in it every fucking day. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have a similar level of experience with it at this point. We've seen all the main story stuff. And, yeah, so, you know, if you have not been following the game at all, one thing to know is that it has this really cool sort of ongoing story setup where the main character, the Traveler, or the Tabibito, as it is yes. in Japanese, which that is a word like Dorobo or something, which is burglar, that is just so much better in Japanese. You just... Tabibito, it's a great word. Yeah, it's it's one of those, it's like, you know, it's like the famous Alfred Lord Tennyson thing where Alfred Lord Tennyson said, like, the most beautiful sounding word in the English language is cellar door. Um, it's got <laughs> that, it just has this, like, aesthetic quality, Tabibito, um, that it has yes. that, like, it's just fun to say, it's fun to hear uh, Paimon say it, you know, um, it's just a good word. Yeah, so the Traveler in Paimon... You start in Mondstadt, which is like the first region, and and then the base game also had Liyue. But there are seven regions overall for the seven sort of gods of this world. And I, over the coming years, they're going to add in all of them. So this game started with a very considerable landmass between uh-huh. Mondstadt and Liyue. But then they added uh, some smaller areas like Dragon Spine, which is pretty big, and then like a smaller stuff like the Golden Apple Archipelago. But now they've added Izuma with 2.0, which is the big Japan-inspired region and is the third area overall and the third big section of the story. Um, so it's sort of like a serialized game. And it, it occurred to me last night, Sean, because 2.0 has chapters or arcs one and two of chapter two which is the third area the numbering is very yes because monstat is the prologue although all of the areas have prologue chat prologue (laughs) acts chapters whatever but it's like yeah you have monstat which is the prologue you have liyue which is chapter one you have now inazuma which is chapter two and then you have like the intermission chapters that kind of connected some of the major story stuff between liyue and inazuma that came out in the intervening time that kind of push some of the main story forward with your sibling and all that stuff Mm -hmm. some of the best stuff in the fucking game it's amazing yeah that one that one chapter that you kind of missed out on when it came out where you actually encounter your sibling uh, that one is fucking awesome it's amazing it's got dan's leaf who is the character i'm most excited to get my hands on whenever he becomes a banner Uh because he is kenjiro suda who is one of my favorite voice actors sato kaiba uh for those who who don't know who kenjiro suda is we'd mention him all the time because he's in a bunch of stuff yes he's great um but anyway where was I? So so the uh, Inazuma section now is like, yeah, part three. Uh, and they've the story, they have chapters one and two of that, but it's far from over this stretch of it. But it hit me last night, Sean. I finished what they've added into the game so far of the main quest line. Mm-hmm. And I went, oh my God, these crazy fuckers did it. They figured out episodic gaming. Yes. <laughs> because this is how you do it, is with an overall world where in between those those big sections you can add little things and you can still go play and have fun. But like I am the moment they add in chapter three, I will be there because I want yes. more of this story. 
And I have never felt compelled by any other episodic game to do it that way, with the possible exception of Hitman 2016, but that was not for story reasons. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, Hitman 2016 nailed it in, a, like, a gameplay sense, um, even if it didn't nail it in, like, a financial sense. It didn't work for the market, but, like, from a design sense, it worked so yeah. much to that game's advantage to do these big, meaty clockwork levels that came out every couple of months. But yeah, Genshin Impact, because it is this gotcha live service game, but because it's this intersection between a gotcha live service game and a more AAA open world RPG, it is able to, yeah, I think, to kind of bridge that gap where, you know, gotcha games always have this structure to their main story where you have, here's like every once in a while you have a big chapter that comes out and you play that. But usually, you know, for like Fate Grand Order or Dragon Ball Legends and that kind of stuff in Grand Blue, um, like the, the story for those are all like basically visual novels um, that then have a little gameplay sections built in there. Whereas this is much more kind of like fully featured. You have big cutscenes that are like well produced that if you're playing on the PS5 run super smooth. That was one of those things where um, you had I had to eventually just go back and rewatch the cutscenes from the first part of the game on like <laughs> YouTube because the frame rate was so bad for those on the base PS4 version um, that like you could barely tell what was happening. But now if you're playing on a modern console or on like a nice pc it runs super great um yeah and it just has this really really great story that then it also is then broken up by those like sort of character stories because you have the big main quests what they call in the english version archon quests um but that's just the main story um but then you also have um i think they call them legends i just think of them as character stories which are big meaty like 90 minute to two hour long quest lines that focus on specific characters and those drop basically whenever they add a new character to the game so there's like probably two or three of them that you haven't played yet because they came out when you were off the game so like eula has one yanfei has one um and those are some of the best content in the whole game like yes, i think hu tao's and zhong li's first one with like the salt goddess those two quest lines are two of the best pieces of content in the game pre inazuma and in inazuma they added in both those two big story quests um and then they also added in two character quests for the two characters that are going to be in 2.0 right now kamisato ayaka is the character you can get in the gacha and they have her story and then the next character in like 18 days or whatever is going to be yoimiya and but they also already put her st character story in the game as kind of this like break between the two main story chapters they've added mm -hmm. and i will say who Tao's was my favorite thing in the game and now it is Yoimiya's, and those yeah. are like my two. And Kamisato's is also very good. Yes. Um, I don't know if I would quite put it on the level of like Hu Tao and Yoimiya. The the fucking pyro characters just have great stories. Mm -hmm. It's just a thing. Zhang Li, as you said, um, uh, Dai Luke, when his story was in the game, was great. Yeah. There's there's several I have not caught up on because there were some from the main like base game. There were so many I just haven't done all of them yet. And then I did go in and I added into my quest line Eula and some of the other ones, which I do love that there's a character who's named after and user licensing agreements that's pretty cool eula might be currently my favorite character in the game both in a wow. story sense and um and and a like gameplay sense so she's the character i'm maining right now is like my main dps character and she is so much fun um, i don't know anything about eula i, I haven't like seen her in anything yet yeah because so because she's she's a monstat character so she's one of the um knights of favonius um okay. and so she uh like her like the main hook for her character is that her sort of like ancestry comes from the old aristocracy from old Mondstadt that everybody hates the shit out of because Mondstadt is currently the country of freedom. But several thousand years ago, it was not that. It was like this sort of, like, sort of harsh dictatorship under the previous god before Venti ascended and became the new god of that land. Um, so she's part of like that old aristocracy lineage. And so a lot of people in Mondstadt kind of despise her for that. And that's like a big hook to her characters for kind of dealing with that. And she's just like super cool and badass. And the voice actress um, is one of my favorites. Uh, it's the same lady who does Mikoto on the main character in the Railgun show, if people have seen that. Um, she's also Candy Shop in Nun Nun Beauty, which is one of my all-time favorite shows. Um, so she's, she's just a great voice actress that does... It's just a great, sick fucking character. She's got a huge claymore, and she does. She's a cryo character, but she just does a shit ton of physical damage. So she just smashes people. And even though she's a claymore <laughs> character, she has a really fast attack speed. So she's just really fun to use because she's very nimble, but just does massive, massive physical damage. And I think she's the only character in the game that plays so heavy into the physical damage kind of area. So she just plays very differently. Nice. 
So, okay, we're, we're all over the place because yeah. Genshin Impact is sort of a lot of different things. But, but like, before we dive into the 2.0 stuff specifically, I guess I just want to end this kind of pre-segment by saying, like, okay, this question could be a novel, but what are sort of, like, the, what is the mixture of things that makes Genshin Impact so special? Because I would say mm -hmm. it is it is the world design, which is this, which is very much like, it is the it is like your first big proper post Breath of the Wild game where it's like taking cues from lots of open world games, but Breath of the Wild is obviously its biggest inspiration, but then it is its own thing beyond that, right? So it yes. feels like the next step in that evolution, which is awesome. Um, and then I would so you have the world, you have really tight but accessible combat. It's sort of as deep mm -hmm. as you want it to be, right? Uh, easy to learn, hard to master is I think a good way to put it. Um, and then I think you have amazing characters and tremendous writing all the way down from the main quest to the tiniest little things you go out and do in the world it is so charming and rich and full of ideas and personality and i think i think if i were to point to any one thing that makes genshin impact so special i do think it's it's that it is so beautifully written mm -hmm. yeah i agree i think i think it's like I think it's it is the sense of the world is so hmm. fully crafted in kind of every aspect of it um and like so much of that goes down to the writing and like the conceptualization of it like I think the the characterization of all the people in the world is fascinating I think like the sense of history they've built into the world is so great it's got that thing you want um which is it has really deep, interesting lore if you want to go in and read every piece of text in the game, which I'm now going back and doing a lot more of because you can now cross-play PS4, PS5 with PC and phone, um, which I don't really want to play on my phone or my PC because my PC is not as powerful as my PS5, but it's a lot easier to read all that text on a screen that's like close to my face rather than on the other side of a room on a TV. Um, so I've been do going back in and reading some of the books they have, and there's a lot of text, and there's so much deep, fascinating lore about the world and how it works and its history, and every region has its own history. That's one of the things that's fun about Inazuma now is getting to sort of learn a little bit more about, like, what's been going on in this side of the world, how they've been dealing with everything that's happened. Um, and so it has all of that, and if you want to go super hardcore into the lore, you can. But also, you can just ignore all that stuff and just play the game and experience the story and the dialogue with the characters and sort of like normal storytelling experience that's not going deep into like the appendices of Lord of the Rings or something like that. And you just read the book. It has that and you get all the benefits of that lore from that as well because you feel how well thought out the world and everything about it is. Well, Lord of the Rings is a great comparison because one of the reasons why Lord of the Rings is such a great story is that even if you ignore every word of the appendices, the lore is suffused through the world. Yes. The world is built on it and so it feels real and three-dimensional and rich and limitless because Tolkien spent so much time thinking about the world. If you want a video com game comparison, You've said many times, Sean, that the most impressive feat of world building since Lord of the Rings for you was Mass Effect. Mm -hmm. Like the first Mass Effect, which just comes out of the gate with this like fully formed world. Genshin Impact is that level of like fully formed world right out of the gate, although much bigger even than, than a Mass Effect. Yeah, because because they're continuing obviously to add on to it as we're going deeper and deeper. But it's that element of like the writing, the character design, the world design, I mean, just like the art design in general is so gorgeous. Their sense of how to make characters like vibrant and appealing and interesting and mm -hmm. unique. Um, it's a good like pulling from a lot of different like uh, sources of like, obviously there's a lot of Breath of the Wild in there. There's just like a lot of general modern anime um, that they're sort of pulling a lot of um, inspiration from. Although I think they're doing the sort of modern anime fantasy thing better in Genshin Impact than any modern anime is, has actually done. Um, and so it's doing all those things. And then the other thing that I think is maybe like the secret sauce that really ties everything together is the music is also yes, it's some of the yes. best music in any video game. Um, it's also some of the most like copious amount of music you've ever seen in the game because they continue to add more and more onto it. Um, because I mean, there is a full soundtrack that they did for the fucking golden apple archipelago area. Um, so there's like so much music in the game and that music itself tells you a story about the place you're living in. Like the Mondstadt music is so different from the Leeway music and the way it sounds and feels in the different regions, like whether it's nighttime or it's afternoon, stuff like that. 
like it tells the story of where you are in that world um, so well just through the music and the audio, like the mystery of Dragon Spine Mountain, the sense of grandeur and like the deep sense of history that Liyue has. Um, and then like that sense of culture um, of Inazuma where, you know, they have all the like Japanese instrumentation uh, because also each soundtrack has been recorded at the Philharmonic Orchestra of whatever major capital of the places being taken places. So oh Monstat was recorded at the London Philharmonic Orchestra. All the leeway stuff was the Shanghai Philharmonic Orchestra, and the Inazuma soundtrack was the Tokyo Philharmonic Orchestra. Okay, um, that's a detail yeah. I did not know. That I was about to say before you even said that, but now I'm sure I'm right about this. The fucking Genshin Impact composition gig has to be the best job for any musician on earth uh -huh. right now. Like, how much fun... I mean, one, permanent job security. Amazing. But, like, also, you like think about how many different things you get to do as a composer and, and how many places you get to go. Now that, as you just said, literally, because you get to go around the world recording this stuff... Man, what a what a cool job that must be. Yeah. You can hear it because the music is just so fucking magnificent. Yeah. yeah, and getting to write music for every instrument you can possibly imagine. Because that's one of the reasons why they're doing that is because then you get like, you know, and the London Philharmonic Orchestra has access to like a 2,000-year-old whatever, I mean, not that old, like, like a 500-year-old like organ, you know, that's like one of the most beautiful, ornate organs in the world because it's like this is where that instrument like has that history like and you have all that with the traditional Chinese instrumentation in Liyue you have all that with the traditional Japanese instrumentation in, in Inazuma um, but that sort of and Yu Peng Chin is the main composer he's also the guy who plays the piano on the soundtracks so like that's where you get like the spine of most of the music is the piano and that's one of the reasons why um, but all of that stuff together is why I think Genshin Impact is so successful, is that it just knows how to create a world, a video game world that is appealing and fun to be a part of. And then it gives you a million different ways um, and convenient ways for you to engage with that world whenever you want to. Um, and that's like sort of their like game design philosophy allows you to do that. And that's to me, that's like the you know, recipe for one of the best video games you could think of. That's also pushing the boundaries of where the industry has been going for a long time with this service stuff, but cracks it in a way that no other company has cracked it so far. Oh yeah. I mean, I think you and I have been banging this drum for a while. You were the first person I heard anywhere banging this drum, but like, I think in five to 10 years, we're going to look back and say Genshin Impact is probably the most influential game of its time mm -hmm. because I think it's cracked. Um, I mean, honestly, Assassin's Creed Infinity, which we mentioned earlier, the, yeah. the new Assassin's Creed project. I was thinking about this last time. I'm like, if they're smart, what that is is it's Genshin Impact, but with Assassin's Creed. Yes, because it is a Assassin's Creed world where like you have your fucking like you know old England area and your Viking area and your and then they'll add their ninja area or whatever, and the story kind of goes off of that. Like this is such a replicable format they've made. This is not like something where I can't imagine anyone else. I can't imagine anyone else getting the exact blend of greatness that Genshin Impact has done, because I think it's very specific to what it is. But so much of this is something you should learn from if you're mm -hmm. making a game anything remotely like this, you know? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, it's it's a really... It's, it's just a really special thing, and it's... You know, I, I think, too... One way I've been thinking about it, too, is it just... There's so many service games. Like, Destiny is, is my go-to just because I've played a lot of it. Yeah. Where it feels like they are constantly trying to guess what will you like as a player, uh -huh. like what will you be into, and they will throw shit at the wall and see what sticks, and it just kind of like co co like coalesces on top of each other and kind of gets old and just crusty. And I feel like Genshin Impact is made by people who are very certain about well, what would we like to play, uh -huh. and like let's put it all together, and it just feels like it's made by people who who. I don't want to say it's like it's made by gamers. All games are made by gamers. You know what I mean by that. But like it is, it just feels like it comes from such this place of like, what would be fun to do here? And if we have a crazy idea, like, oh, what if we did a tower defense game? Let's try it. And you know, it doesn't have to be what the game is, but we can try it, and then it's really fun. You know, yes. stuff like that. It just feels like it's so much from this place of like confidence and like knowledge of what will be fun to do, not. Hopefully they like this, and if not, we'll pull it out and we'll try something else, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that comparison is good because I think the problem with Destiny and the reason why, like, I haven't 
touched a second of Destiny since I like got deep into Genshin Impact. Like I tried to get back into Destiny and then I just couldn't because I had already played a bunch of Genshin Impact. And like it feels so old and creaky and cumbersome. Like you just can't pl- load up Destiny and play 10 minutes of Destiny because you've barely gotten into the game. Like even in the PS5 version, it still takes so long to get into the game, decide what you want to do, load into that area, start doing that mission. And it's like that game is super fun. I love Destiny to death, but like it is a thing where they never quite could find a way to f- to match what was really good about that game, which is its world design and its combat and all of that, like that, the gamey game part of Destiny and a lot of its art and stuff is fucking stellar. Some of the best in the industry and its genre, but it couldn't find a way to match that with like the superstructure in which all of that takes place, which is the map and the story and like all that stuff. Like it's all creaky and cumbersome and is like beholden to a lot of older design philosophies that don't accommodate the service game thing that that yeah genshin impact because it has its roots with mihoyo in the gacha industry that that is like the number one most important thing the number one most important thing in gacha is to make the game easy and fun and accessible to play at any point for however long you want to play it and then the second most important thing is to make good appealing characters that people want to pay money to get right those are the things that like that genre is built on fundamentally more so than gameplay mechanics or anything else um and genshin impact is able to starting from that place nail all of that it is a very easy game to play in whatever burst you want to now more so than ever if you're a playstation person because now you can play it on multiple devices um but then also, they they then they also have just like great characters that are so appealing and so fun. Every single character in the game, I think, is one that I'm just like either excited that I have or excited to get. Uh, especially all the Inazuma ones, I think they just have a lineup of characters that are some of the most interesting and exciting ones in the game. It's unfair. It's yeah. like actively unfair. There's no Inazuma character I've met that will be a playable character. Obviously, not every character becomes a playable character, um, but of the ones that will be playable characters, there's none where I go. I can live without them. <laughs> yes. like they're all like, I want this one and I want this one. And I have two five-star pyro characters. I don't need a third. But if I want Hinoyama or Hiyoyama. Hinomiya, sorry. I'm bad at remembering. This is one thing that will be a theme in this episode. I'll tell you right now. I know all the Genshin Impact characters. I promise I do. I am often bad at remembering their names. <laughs> It's fine. It, is, it is hard because you have German-inspired names, Chinese-inspired names, and now Japanese-inspired names. Yes. So you have to remember a lot of different sort uh-huh. of like structures of naming uh, to remember everyone in Genshin. Because I just like remember them by like their voice and their appearance, uh-huh. you know. So it's like there's like uh, the other day I was trying to tell my brother like he was like who do you play with and I'm like well I have Beto because Beto's always on my team yes. so I know her name and then I'm like and then I have this. I have Ghost Fire Lady. She's fucking great. And that's Hu Tao. But yeah. I was forgetting her name at the second. And then, like, I have Water Boy. That's Zhang Li. But, or not Zhang No, that's Jing Shu. Jing Shu. Sorry. See, this is what I mean. This is what I mean. The Chinese names are harder because I don't speak any Chinese or know how to. Chinese has difficult pronunciation. Yeah. Japanese has nice, easy pronunciation. Chinese has very hard pronunciation. So. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, it's, it's so fun. I, I think. And I'll also say, you know, if you are someone who, like me, comes from a background of being very suspicious of gacha games and having never, like, quite, like, like always seen the genre as, like, this kind of, like, seedy gambling thing, which I think to a lot of maybe Westerners of, like, my age or older in, like, the gaming sphere, it's a li- it's such a new thing and it can be a very seedy yes. gambling thing, right? Um, Genshin Impact is a great way to look at it and go, oh, this is how it can work as, like, this is a business model that can support the game and where you can pay money and not feel like you're being ripped off or anything and have fun with it. And, like, there is a side to Genshin Impact, like with any gacha game where you can spend way too much and ruin your life. Um, but, you know, I mean, if we're being honest, you can do that with lots of games that have no gacha mechanics, too. So, you know, um, it's it's not an inherent reason to distrust the games. And I still, still see that in the Western press a lot. That, I think- like, just wants to dismiss Genshin Impact because it's gotcha, and that automatically makes it bad yeah. somehow. What, what and then, I'm like- really frustrated with with that is that they never have that attitude towards Apex Legends and Fortnite, even though it's, exactly. those are gotcha games. It's just you're not yes. rolling for characters. Um, yeah, it's a thing where it's like it's just such a ubiquitous monetization mechanic that it's like it's 100 percent is something you need to be careful of if you know you're someone or you suspect you are going to have problems with it like there are lots of different resources you can look online for like techniques if you still want to engage with the game but are worried about that side that you can do 
um like Todd like having a friend that you talk about it with and like being open with and like different ways you can kind of check yourself to make sure you're not spending too much money but it's a like business model that has been one of the dominant forms of monetization in video games for like eight years at this point for most of the world it's like it's it isn't actually new i think is kind of like where it's at it's just like a lot you're of the right. western yeah. hardcore quote-unquote gaming like culture hasn't caught up to where that genre has been because it's kind of ignored it because it's mostly a thing that happens in the asian markets no you're right and it is it is a total it's an unconscious bias that that like i didn't bring up overwatch or apex just now like overwatch it, in some ways is way more fucking predatory because what do you what do you get with overwatch when you spend money you get a hat yeah like i don't know you get actual stuff in Genshin impact um, I don't want to insult people who play Overwatch a bunch. I don't know as much about that. I've, I've only played it a little bit. And, like, I guess you do pay for the base game there, but it's a little different. What I was going to say also is that, like, I've seen so much of, like, the dismissal of, like, Genshin Impact for that. But, like, there hasn't been nearly enough the press, I feel like, about how games cost $70 now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that's also something to talk about. Like, that's a... Like, let's just be honest. That's an objectively ridiculous amount of money at a certain point when you're talking about, like, I'm going to pay $70 for this thing. We can understand all of the, like, economic conditions that go into that and whatnot, but it's a big chunk of change for most people to drop on one thing. Um, you know, there's a reason why gotcha games like this have, have been more popular in much of the world is because the barrier to entry is zero. And then if you want to get into it, you know, at a certain level, maybe you start paying more, but you pay, like, in $5 chunks, not $70 at once, mm -hmm. you know? So... It's, it's just one reason why young people who have less disposable income are into it, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, Genshin Impact, it's great. I should also say before we get into this, this next part of the discussion, because I wanted to talk about the 2.0 update and the PS5 update. Um, you and I are both lucky enough to have PlayStation 5s that yes. we play it on there. I know not everyone does. So Genshin Impact, I have tried on my iPhone and my iPad, my PC and my... Um, and my PS5. I've mostly just played on my PS5, but especially now with the cross-play, I've checked it out on those other places. And it is a pretty poorly optimized game in a lot of places. Like, my, I have the new iPad Pro from 2021 with the M1 chip. It's more powerful than any, literally any of the MacBooks that are out now. Um, and the game does not run super great on it. It's not mm -hmm. super well optimized. I think there are some Android phones that are like gaming focused that can run it pretty well. And I think PCs like mine can run it pretty well if you've got a graphics card and stuff like that. But, you know, the base PS4 version, some mobile versions can run pretty crappy. Um, I am, though, Sean, blown the fuck away by the PS5 native app version. Yeah. Because the, the PS4 back compat version on PS5 was totally fine. It ran at 60. It was a little hitchy in places, but it was good. It's definitely a big step up from what I understand from the PS4 version. I never played oh, yeah. on there, but you told me about it. Um, but the PS5 native app, like the biggest addition to me is HDR. I think this game mm -hmm. now, I would say, is maybe my favorite use of HDR in a video game just because the colors are so fucking nice in this game. And it is kind of night and day how much it brings out in like the full nuance of the color. But also like that resolution boost, the load times are practically non-existent. This is this is like the PS5 is magic thing where you yeah. will like, I'll be in Inazuma and I'll be running around and like, oh, the next quest is over in Liyue, which is a completely different world. There's no shared assets over there and it'll take half a second to get in there. It's yeah. insane. Um, but it is a, I know you had played more of the PS5 version than I had, but I really hadn't played any of it until I jumped in with 2.0 and it is a hell of an update. Yeah, no, it's a great, great version of the game. Yeah, because because like the main stuff is that it is because the frame rate is even more stabilized. Um, like it's not a perfect sixty, but like the only time I feel like the frames drop is kind of when you want it to, when you just like have destroyed everything, right? Yes. So it's like the character I'm using, Eula, her ultimate ability kind of creates this. They call it a light fall sword, but it's like this magic floating sword that as you do damage over the course of the next like five seconds, it builds up more and more and more. And then after five seconds, it hits the ground and explodes in this mess of particles. But because it's kind of delayed, you can then time it so that you use like a bunch of other abilities timed around the same time to just sort of get everything to go at the same time. So you can just get the fucking world explodes and there's fire and fucking wind effects and lightning shooting out. And there's just like ice crystal shooting everywhere. And 
when you do that, the frame will tank a little bit, but that's where you're like, I want the frame rate to die because that's how much damage I did. It, I didn't just kill the enemy, I killed the fucking frame rate of this video game. But other I than call that the from software effect. Exactly. Where there's like, moments when you just you just want to see everything b- burn for a minute. Yes. Um, so other than those moments, the game runs super smooth. It's got a really nice high resolution, and they have also gone back and for a bunch of the textures in the game, like specifically kind of reworked them to make them like sharper and more higher. They're detail. very striking at this yeah. point. Yeah. Um, particularly like the character models in particular have just so much great detail that comes out a lot more in the PS5 version. Um, yeah, it is. If you if you have a PS5, um, it is a great, great, great way to play that game. Um, it feels it's, it's one awesome. of the best technical showcases on the PS5, and I would not have expected that. But if mm-hmm. you are someone who has a PS5 and like Sean and I, kind of just like to seek out the games that kind of show the thing off. Unexpectedly, Genshin Impact Low Key is a great technical showcase for the load times. It uses the haptics really well. Mm-hmm. It makes very fun use of the speaker and the controller yes. for like I love cooking on the PS5 version uh-huh. because it puts all the pot sounds in your hand. It's they added great. that into 2.0 because that didn't used okay. to be there. So when when the 2.0 update came out and I went to Inazuma and got a bunch of cool Japanese food recipes, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna cook some of this stuff. And then all of a sudden cooking noises started coming out of my controller. Like, when the fuck did they put that in? That wasn't there it's- like a week ago. If, if Breath of the Wild had been on the Wii instead of the Switch, they would have done that in Breath of the Wild. It's, yes. it's a very Nintendo kind of touch uh-huh. with the speaker. I love it. Um, but yeah, you, you have all of that. You have the load times. You have, and I think, again, the colors. Like, mm-hmm. oh my god. Because the PS4 version did not have native HDR, but on the PS5 has kind of the auto HDR. And I would sort of leave that on for Genshin Impact because it still looked fine. Um, but like the actual true HDR, it is a stupendous implementation. Cause like I had seen 150 hours of this game without yeah. HDR and then you put it in and it's like, there's like a hundred shades of green in the grass and it just blows your mind. Yeah. It's very cool stuff. If you have a big 4k HDR TV, this game is unbelievably gorgeous. 100%. Yes. It, it is just, it brings out like that really kind of vivid rich quality of the art um and their use of color like across the whole game has always yes. been phenomenal and i feel like particularly nazima has some of the most rich just gorgeous use of color i've seen in any video game it's kind of funny because i was thinking in my head like man this is the most uh gorgeous game i've seen since the last game set in ancient japan yeah. ghost of tsushima um, and then I, I, the more I played them, go. I, I think they must have played Ghost of Tsushima. There's a lot of stuff here where the color work reminds me of that. And then there is a specific story event that is just an homage to what Ghost of Tsushima mm-hmm. did with the widescreen like standoff moments. Yes. And I went, yep, they played. These people have good taste in yes. games, is what I will say. One hundred percent. I mean, it is, it is, you know, Mihoyo's literal logo of the company that is like on their, or it's like the motto that is on their logo is Tech Otaku Save the World. This is, it's a Chinese company, but, like, it is made by a bunch of fucking hardcore anime nerds and, like, video game nerds, and, like, you yes. can feel it um, so much in this, like, very loving way um, of, like, it's it's not that, you don't get that sense of it's, like, the otaku or nerd thing where they're, like, so, like, pessimistic and cynical and negative and critical of all the media they consume. It's more just, like, man, dude, anime is so fucking cool, like... <laughs> Like, man, Dragon Ball Z is sick as fuck. Like, it's that kind of attitude. It's, it's like the attitude I like to try to carry towards media. It's why, I like, on this podcast, we try to not cover intentionally media that we think is really bad unless we have a specific reason. Like, with, like, the Batman podcast where we're going to do all of a certain thing, we're going to end up watching Batman and Robin. But generally, we choose to go see, watch things or play things we specifically want to because I think it's just a lot better and healthier to have that really enthusiastic, yes. positive attitude towards the media you consume and that's so much of I think what you feel from the personalities behind what is making this game what it is has that enthusiasm for the source material and the inspiration that they're pulling from. Absolutely. It's like it reminds me of a uh, my favorite comment we've ever gotten on a weekly suit Gundam video was someone said, "Man, why these guys got to agree on everything?" <laughs> and I went, yeah. "Because we're that's why we're doing the podcast because we both love Gundam." And we like talking about it, and that's the reason it exists. Yeah. Um, no, totally. And it's it, this is also the reason, Sean, why you and I play the game with Japanese voices. Yes. Um, there are four voice languages in the game, right? There's English, yes. Korean, Chinese, and Japanese. Japanese. Which is crazy I, that, by the way, like none of those versions are like off set or something, which is very typical for gacha games right. because they're you know so heavy with like frequent updates that you would normally have the English language version is like a year behind or something. 
there are four different full localizations with four different full voice tracks. And this has more voice acting than even like a normal $60 JRPG has. Like all yes. the main story and character missions are fully voiced and they all come out at the same fucking time. How I have no idea how they do that. They have like one of the most efficient localization uh, pipelines in the industry. They must. Sean, I'll tell you how they do that. This game made a billion dollars in three months. Yes. That's how they do that. They have a lot of money, um, which is nice. It means we get a better game, but like they have yeah. a lot of money. Um, but no, it's, and I think, but but the reason you and I played in, and I'm sure those other voice tracks are good, yeah. um, but the Japanese, I think you can kind of tell that's where their heart is because every fucking character, you can just feel the people at, at, at um, um, Mihoyo. Uh, uh, Mihoyo, sorry, I wanted to call them Otaku. They're called Mihoyo, and their logo says Otaku. Um, it's just like, oh, we've got this character, Don's Life. He's really cool. He's brooding. He's Kendra Otsuda. Yes, uh-huh. I can just feel them like sitting around the table, just naming their favorite voice actors. You can totally feel it with what they do with, with your girl, Miyuki Suwashiro, yes. in this update. It's just, it's like, it is so joyous in how it breaks out all of those actors, you know? I mean, yeah, it's very much, you can, I mean, I, I, it feels like the, like, forces behind the Japanese voice acting. I mean, the the Japanese Genshin Impact YouTube channel, every time there's a new character, they have like a 20-minute interview video with the actor who plays the character. They haven't done the Jaime Saudi one. They haven't put that up yet. I'm really, I, I really want to see that one because I really like her a lot. Um, but they just did the one with Nobunaga, the guy who plays Kazuha. Um, and and they had him in like this traditional Japanese tea house looking room, and he was wearing this beautiful kimono because Kazuha's like whole thing is he's this like samurai poet guy. He you know he puts degozaru at the end of his words, which is like a very fancy samurai way of talking. It's like the way that Kenshin talks in Roni Kenshin. He uses sesha as his personal pronoun, and so they went so full out, and he has like a the little like you know traditional Japanese fan and all that shit, and it's like. I don't know where and how along the pipeline those decisions are made. Like, I don't know what Mihoyo, the Chinese office's, like, relationship is with whatever, however the Japanese side of it is handled. But it, like, it feels like there is a lot of weight and emphasis being put behind that side of it because of the anime connection. Um, Like, even though it is a Chinese game, it feels like you're supposed to play it with the Japanese voices on. Yeah, and, and, you know, maybe some of you are rolling your eyes like, shut up, you guys, you listen to everything in Japanese. But it's like, these are like the biggest voice actors in the industry. It is an all-star fucking cast, and it is only getting, like, more all-star over time. It's pretty crazy. Like, and because the Japanese voice acting industry is the best in the world, that is just an objective truth. They have the most talent. They have, their talent works the most. Like, it's the most developed voice acting industry. Yeah, it's by far the most robust industry, so it is, like, naturally going to produce the best people because that's like that's yeah. part of the culture that's developed over the past several decades over it's there. the same way british theater companies have more shakespearean actors than american exactly. ones I, it's yeah. just how it works um genshin impact is this game where you just have this growing collection of the best voice actors on earth and that alone is something that makes it so special you know yeah, and it is, I do feel like in an Ozma they were just showing off, because I had a moment where I was, like, <laughs> thinking this, like, I mean, God, like, who, who who do they not even have in the game yet, who's, like, a big, like, voice actor in the modern anime industry, and I had this, like, you know what, they don't have Aine Sakata, who's, like, one of the biggest ones, she's Ochako in My Hero Academia, we very recently talked about her briefly, she has a small role in Gundam Age, and, like, I shit you not, like, five minutes after that, I met the Yaisama, the Miko character who comes out and she says one sentence. I'm like, you motherfuckers. It's like, it's like <laughs> I, it, the timing was so perfect in my head. I basically laughed out loud to myself in my room. It's like, how, like, did you read my mind? And not only that, like you gave her this, like, is a sick, like shrine maiden lady to play. Uh, it's so perfect. Like the casting and everything for all the voice actors is also so sharp. Um, that yes, if you are into anime, um, and you like that whole side of it, like it is well worth playing the game with the Japanese voices on. Because also, if you understand Japanese or at least enough of Japanese, I also do think the Japanese script is better. Like from what I understand, yeah. um, having seen people on Twitter who like speak Chinese and talk about like the differences between the Chinese and English translations, the way they talk about those differences, it feels like or it seems to me that the Japanese script is much more similar to the Chinese script. Because I think the English localization is good, but it like I think it 
makes some like unnecessary changes around the edges or it's I think is maybe hard for it to translate some concepts or some elements. So like if you have enough familiarity to get some benefit from that, I do also think that the Japanese script is just generally better to me than than what the English localization gives you. Yeah, it's never as different as like Final Fantasy 15 where yes. they'll just be talking about two different things, but it is a fun exercise where if you speak at least even a little Japanese, You'll be listening and you'll see like, oh, this this proper noun has changed. Um, oh, he's saying that more humbly here. Paimon's, Paimon's jokes are often different, which makes sense because that's comedy and you yeah. have to shift that up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it is, a, it is a fun... And I'll admit, I... There is so much in this game that there's definitely some stuff where I don't listen to every single voiced line because I I have to f- f- do I, stuff during my day. I hit that fucking square button and I let autoplay go, okay. baby. I sit back and I enjoy it because that's you know yeah. that's what I need in my life. For, for the main stuff, yes, definitely, that's what I do. Um, sometimes it's a little it's a little bit much. I do that for everything. That's that's not just Genshin Impact. There's a lot of games that have a lot of voice acting where sometimes I'm like, ah, I just want to read the text. But when I do sit back and enjoy that, that is something I, I enjoy. The Japanese script, as you say, is very good. Uh, the funniest thing in the game to me is that the word Genshin does not appear in the English script. Yes. Um, which is the weird... What is, what is Genshin in Japanese? It's... it's because what uh, did they translate it as an English It's origin word? and um, so gin like the kanji right. for origin, sheen like the kanji for kanji god. For god. Yeah. No, I knew that, but I oh. mean, what is the word that they use it for in the game that they use in English? Oh, right? I mean, so in the in the lore, I don't remember what the English term is because it's some like weird, obscure Latin term, which is what yeah. they did for most of that stuff. Which is a thing I don't like. Like, I don't like that they use the word archon instead of god. Um, I think right. it's like they kind of obscure some of like the mythology a little bit with like weird Latin-y terminology. Um, but the word Genshin in the lore comes from. Um, someone who has been given a vision or an eye of God, as its like original name is, um, who then has the potential potential to rise and become a god themselves um, okay. in the lore. So it's it's that's something that Venti tells you at the end of the Monstat arc, is he says like, hey, like this is what visions are, and this is like you know you are like you might be a Genshin, like you might be like these people, like one day you could potentially rise it's- to Celestia and become a god yourself. I wanted you to remind me of that because I remember getting to that scene and Venti saying that and I'm hearing him talk about Genshin and it's not in the English script and I'm like, yeah. did they really just not use the title of the game in the English script? That's super weird. Yes. Because they use some, as you say, weird Latin term. It's all sorts of stuff. It's like the, um, whatever the, the, like, they call them visions in English, but don't they just call them kami in Japanese? The, like, so it's, yeah, well, and the visions are kami no me, so they're the eyes no of me, God. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, That's and so you cooler. have um, you also have then like the uh, SNES nine people like Tartalia. They have their like second ones that in English they call the delusions. That's why Tartalia can turn into that like lightning form in the boss fight. And but in Japanese it's called the Jagan. It's just the evil eye, um, which I like more. So good, so good. Anyway, we're getting into the weeds here. But should we transition to talking about this 2.0 update and uh, yeah. why it is so fucking good? Yeah. So so first, I'd like lay out a little bit what specifically this 2.0 update is and like what's in the game so far is they've added um, three of the Inazuma Islands. So it's not even the entire Inazuma continent yet. There's going to be three more islands added in. I'm guessing the 2.1 update. That might be 2.2. They haven't said exactly what the timeline is. Um, so that's like basically half the landmass of Inazuma and I'm guessing the two chapters we have of the main story is half of the story. If it's structured basically the way that Liyue was, where the Liyue story at 1.0 was only half of that story, even if they had the whole continent there. And then later they added in the next update, the second half of the story. Um, so you have that. You have the two character missions for Ayaka and Yoimiya. You have Ayaka as an unlockable character. You will have in the second half, because each version update, like 2.1, 2.0, whatever, like those always have two different banners. So the next banner, it'll be Yoimiya and also a character that has not in the, been in the story yet called Sayu, who's like a little ninja lady that they showed in a trailer once. Um, there's all that stuff. Um, and then there's like a couple of smaller events. There are like some new bosses uh, that you can fight in Inazuma. I think there are two new bosses right now. Um, so it's a good chunk of content, but it isn't the entirety of what of everything that the Inazuma region is going to be. That's probably going to be in the next update. But it is um, it is a lot of stuff because it is which is the craziest thing. Because yeah. if this were everything, I, I, that'd be, I not story wise because there's stuff left over, but like it's plenty to like satisfy me. It's so much. The idea that this is half of what this is is 
so f- I want to like laugh because that's so crazy yes. and like bold and ambitious. But that's what Genshin does. So yeah, because yeah. if you look at the the maps, like it, it looks to me that it will probably be about the size of Liyue in total landmass. When right. assuming the next three islands are of similar size of the current three ones, it will be like very much in that ballpark. But one of the things that's interesting is that because they're islands, the way the Inazuman Islands are designed is much more similar to Dragon Spine. Um, in that they are much denser than than how Mondstadt and Liyue were designed. Um, there's like less kind of like dead space uh, between areas and more like layers and stuff like that. They're kind of like digging through. So it's a big, big, meaty fucking update um, that, yeah, I think is... I'll just say like straight up as we dig into it, I think um, specifically the main island, Narukami, I think that is the best area they've designed so far. Um, like, I think this is some of the best content of the game. I think so far, this is only the first half of this story, but like of the Mondstadt and Liyue and what we've seen so far, and it seems they're going with Inazuma, I think this is the best of the main story arcs they've done. It's like one of the most interesting because they have all the kind of expositionary stuff that the first two areas had to deal with more out of the way. And this is much more like you just get into the meat of it so quickly. Um, I just think like top down, this is some of the best content they've put into the game so far which is super exciting for it to be the first major version update they've done right going from a 1.0 and it's like 0.1 etc versions to your 2.0 update um there's a lot that miyoyo mihoyo had to prove by adding this in and saying this is what a big content update looks like now that the game is running and it's the full game that we're running every single month and adding new stuff every single month um there's so much writing i think on inazuma being so good and it has exceeded my expectations actually quite a bit in terms of the quantity of content and the quality of the content available in this update yeah i don't even know if i want to say it exceeded my expectations because i expect nothing but good things from this team but i'm still blown away yeah. i agree 100 percent. sorry to that weekly suit gundam commenter but i'm gonna agree with sean here <laughs> um that that i do think this is the best uh overall i, I think i i want to temper that and just say that like that's not to like put down like leeway is still so yeah. fucking gorgeous and beautiful but i do think i agree with you that i prefer some of the like denser design like in terms of exploration my favorite area to explore so far was dragon spine yes. yeah. um and i think this has that quality but over a much bigger and more fleshed out area and so i agree with that i think they they've done more it feels like now that they have a version running with full hdr they've done even more stuff with like color design mm -hmm. in this area that i really love because the color work in Liyue was amazing, but this is on another level, what they're doing in Inazuma. Um, and then I think I agree with the story is... I, I liked the the Mondstadt main story quest was good. It wasn't the best thing in the world. It wasn't the best thing in the game at the time, but I thought it was a good start. The Liyue quest was, was really solid. I thought it was maybe a little long in the tooth in places, and some of the side stuff was more interesting. This, though, just like every second of it, is really entertaining. You're constantly being thrown, like, new characters and ideas. It's very focused on, like, this corner of the world. So, like, we took care of a lot of, I feel like, the big, like, overall overarching story stuff in that in those intermission quests with Donsleif. And so now this really just gets to be another story so focused on this culture and it's a really rich culture they've built and drawn out. And I'm just again, you hit that that cliffhanger basically at the end of, of what we have so far and I just cannot wait for more. I want more story. It's so good. And you know, sometimes with this kind of thing the story is not my favorite part of it, but I, I love it. It's a great plot they've they're 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 going through so far with so many cool characters yeah and and i just think it is like it's better paced than the main story stuff was because i agree with you with the leeway thing um because also leeway had the problem when i played it of it stopped halfway through but where they stopped it was really sudden it's basically like there's a part in the story where ganyu first appears and she invites you to the jade palace and that's where it cut off and that's it didn't weird. and it, it just kind of felt like a thing where maybe they had wanted to put the full leeway story and it just wasn't feasible so they had to find a spot to cut it off this feels like like a good cliffhanger at the end of like not even at the end of like an episode of anime it feels like the end of like a season of tv or like part one of a two-part movie or something mm -hmm. like a lord of the rings fellowship of the ring or something like that where you like you end on this point where you're like i really want to see what's next i got this big chunky i mean it's a good like five six hours of like story content they have in the game of just the main story stuff not even including i can yoimiya's uh quest lines so it's like a good big chunk of story content that then leaves you at this point where you're like 
have just seen the enemy be routed. You're like ready to go join the rebellion and go to like the new islands and stuff like that. And it's a really solid point to stop and kind of leave you hanging on that while you then go off and do the other events and stuff they're going to do in the meantime. Here's one question I have. Okay. Um, in, in one part of one of the islands, there's this big like barrier that's not one of the electric barriers that I can't pass through. There's a quest is line the, about that. There's a quest line. Okay. Yes. I was yeah. wondering, if, is that a... Because that sometimes happens in other parts of the world because they haven't added on the continent yet. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is that like... Is that going to be added later or is that a quest line? So it sounds like, okay, I have to follow more world quests. Yes, yeah. there's yeah, there's a world quest. You, do you, I think you start that one in the big base uh, that like the Shogunate has that big like military camp mm -hmm. um, right near there. If you go in there, you get a world quest that then eventually okay. you will destroy that barrier and you can explore in there. Yeah. Awesome. Because, you know, with all of that other stuff that they've added that you listed, Sean, that means we also have new... Um, god statues that you pray to yes. and then you get your so you give in the uh what do they call these ones the electro the uh, electroculus the, the electroculus they, there's a different name for it in all yes. of them there's the geoculus this is the electroculus so you go find those in the world that's a little exploration thing i absolutely adore mm -hmm. is finding all of that stuff because they're these little when you walk around the world they'll show up on your compass but they won't show you like elevation or anything so like you just have a puzzle to go find them and it's very fun um so you have all of those and then you have the electro sigils which you use to heighten your electrogram like level and then that is a whole puzzle mechanic scattered throughout the world so they've really revamped a lot of the exploration stuff too so it's not exactly what you were doing in leeway or monstat yes. it's similar but they've upgraded a lot of it and you're doing new kinds of stuff so it's just also been so refreshing because i think you and i both have explored Liyue and Mondstadt like very thoroughly at this point and it's so fun to have a new area where you have all new chests and puzzles and you have all of those mechanics I just mentioned and so you feel like you're making like so much progress in these like quick bursts of time it's very fun yeah and I think that's one of the things that's most impressive is that they basically don't reuse any puzzle mechanics that have mm -hmm. been in the game so far like almost everything like you know you're not running into a bunch of little like pillars that have a pyro symbol on them that you have to hit with your pyro character and get all three of them in a certain time frame like there's one or two of those with some electro ones but even those are like contextualized in different puzzle formats so like everything is different like you have the barriers you need to find electrograms to get through one thing i love so much is the you, the like big like zip line thingies they basically added in where you zap across these like different markers that appear in the sky and you can kind of zoom through the world really quickly um, and there's some uh, challenges around that that give you primo gems and stuff mm -hmm. they're very fun yes um it, it's something where i feel like they've always had these like gliding challenges that are fine but they are like a little bit slow because you go through like the big wind circles or whatever that boost you this is i think a much more active fun version of that that kind of takes a similar concept but evolves it and makes it better um they have all the puzzles around you like activating the different like electro stones in the world and then like spinning around and you having to like match them up and stuff like that it's just it's a thing where you're not doing the same kind of thing you had already done over the past nine months the game has been out um they're continuing to evolve and improve the design which i think was like really critical for inazuma um because that's i think that's part of what i meant when i said earlier that this there was a lot that Mio had to prove with this update because it's the first new continent they've added to the game is that they needed to be able to show that they can add new stuff to the game and it doesn't just feel like it was something that they had like sketched out two years ago but they just hadn't filled in yet and it's just like the same kind of thing you had been doing but instead they clearly have been taking the specific lessons they've learned from all the content they've made since then and have used that to make to improve what they've been doing on so it's clear to me that like dragon spine was like probably a way for them to think through how to design some of the stuff they're going to do in inazuma with like the mountain and all the underground areas they had um or they have in inazuma uh, and like kind of fleshing out all of that then you have all the boat stuff in the archipelago and then they brought all the boat stuff now over to um inazuma and so clearly that was them testing out how do you design things on islands i love so much how much the island design focuses your exploration right because it, it in inazuma it means that like you know I have Narakami Island, and this is like, I can just run around on this island and try to explore this, and it's easier to not get distracted by seeing something off in the distance and going like way afield from where you're trying to be. 
Um, and I think the way that like the island design kind of contains your exploration and focuses it uh, is a really smart element that is kind of building on those two major updates they've had between Dragon Spine and the summer update. Um, that clearly they've been testing those ideas and learning from them, and it's really crystallized into something very special um, that makes this the most fun I've had just running around in the world and exploring in Genshin. Absolutely. Narukami Island, of course, named for the hero of Persona 4. Yes. Um, great little reference in there. I'm kidding. Um, but yes, no, I totally agree. And it is fun to see some of those different things kind of come to fruition here. Like, uh, I'll admit, the, the Golden Apple Archipelago, I thought, was my least favorite thing I'd played in the game so far. I thought some of the, like, getting around the, like, climbing challenges was just cumbersome. But then you see how they've you were used that as like a springboard into Inazuma and it's like all of those problems go away. I think it uses the boats better and the climbing and like you can see how it is iterative in that very real way. Like one little thing I actually appreciate about Genshin Impact is that sometimes in your mailbox you'll get a little pull from them mm -hmm. and it's not your normal like corporate like what did you like this thing yes or no. They actually go pretty deep on like did you play this? Did you like this? What did you like about this? And I can tell from the questions that they're actually going to use that data. Yes. That it's not just like busy work. That's the kind of thing where you can tell they're actually like working to improve it. And I love that. Like that's, it's funny you mentioned that because those, because so when I was teaching at my old job, like I would, at the end of like each sort of trimester, I would do a poll thing like, or like with uh, Google Forms and stuff with my students. And then after I played Genshin Impact and see how they formatted theirs, I realized like, oh, this is formatted so so much better like and I completely redesigned how I was doing that in my class because it's like this is because you could just see oh the data you're getting from like the way they're saying they're kind of breaking out the questions and the like options they give and how many options and how like they will like zoom in with multiple questions on one point um it's they're really smartly designed polls um, that I actually like learned from those and use that in my job because yeah it does feel like and I think you can see, as you're playing the subsequent updates, you can see that they take that feedback really seriously and are incorporating it. So it's something that it makes it so successful as a live game is that it feels very nimble and agile and being able to adapt and um, adjust to where the community is feeling and kind of the, the strengths and weaknesses of what they've been putting in the game so far. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they give you a shit ton of mora for it. So why the hell, yep. why the hell not? Fill it out. Um, it's a good way to entice people. Yeah, and I give my students 20 bucks when they fill out their uh, <laughs> Google Forms. So, yeah, it's the same methodology. That's, def that's definitely illegal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, we have, they, they do that for us at college. You know, they have the, like, automatic uh -huh. polls that the college does. And it's funny how you get the different professors like, I'll give you this much extra credit if you please just fill out the fucking poll because I need it for my job. Um, but yeah, I should just give them more. I should just promise to give my students just gold yeah. coins. Um, be great. Anyway, um, yeah. So all the 2.0 stuff, so fun. Where do you want to kind of zoom in now? Uh, I guess let's talk about some of the story because I've been having so much fun. I think they just have done such an amazing job with it. And I want to start off with just like the whole kind of setup. Because I think it's really fascinating the way they're pulling from real Japanese history to kind of establish what is going on here. Um, so, you know, so Nazuma obviously is based very, very heavily on Japan. You have people with kimonos, you have katanas, you've got like fucking, like literally they use the word samurai and stuff like that. You have sakura blossoms. Um, but in this fantasy world, it's also like the the land of Electro or Lightning, ruled over by the Lightning Goddess, um, Miyuki Swashiro, our queen, uh, the Raiden Shogun, uh, which is such a fucking, it's so cool every time someone says Raiden Shogun, um, so good. Um, and so she had uh, like a year ago from the events of the game, in, like implemented what is called the Sakoku, which is the closed country or like the bound country order, meaning that nobody is allowed, no foreigners are allowed to come in. Like immigration both in and out of the country is like strictly limited. Um, and then with that also is the like vision hunt or the Megari Day um, in Japanese, which is like the order to, to hunt down the visions. And she's collecting the visions of people in her country um, which are the things that give people magic powers in the world of Genshin and embedding them in her like giant god statue that she has. Um, and we don't know exactly why. It's implied, they talk about that she is seeking some form of eternity, which for the game seems to mean like one part eternity, like one part tranquility. That it seems like she's trying to attain 
like this equilibrium where nothing changes, everything is perfect. And for whatever reason, she seems to have decided that that people having the elemental powers um, is disrupting that in some way. And this all that stuff was kind of set up at the end of the Leeway chapter where Jung Lee tells you a lot of this stuff. Um, one other thing he tells you that I, that I always thought was a cool bit of lore is that when that happened, when the Sakaku decree happened and the vision hunt began, that's when people in the world stopped getting new electro visions because the different elemental visions are given to you by those gods in some way. Um, so like she has like kind of cut everything off. The thing that's really interesting about that whole setup is that that is really similar to what happened and started to ha establish in the early Tokugawa Shogunate or the Edo period in Japan. So it's fun for me because this is literally like 20 years after what I just played in Neo 2 is what's happening in this game. So it feels like my like Japanese history overview is just continuing on its path. Uh, because in the early Tokugawa Shogunate era, which is what happened after the Warring States period, the Warring States period ultimately coalesced into Tokugawa Ieyasu sort of winning. He takes control. He establishes his shogun government, the Bakufu, um, which is a term that they also use to talk about the writing shogun's government in uh, Genshin. And he sort of rules for a little bit, passes away. His son takes over. And I think it's like the third or fourth Tokugawa shogun eventually implements this policy of Sakoku. Because up to that point, there was pretty free and open trade with Western companies or countries, specifically the Dutch and the Portuguese in Japan. Um, and then I think it's Tokugawa Iemitsu did it, and he said no more. He implemented a series of policies known as the Sakaku Decree uh, that then cut off the country, basically. And that's why until from like 1620-ish until like 1860-something, when Matthew Perry did his whole thing over there, um, the country had no like deep, meaningful interaction with any um, foreign nation, basically, whatsoever. So that's... a you know, they're clearly pulling from that history uh, to inform what they're doing here with Genshin. And then one other detail that they pull that I like a lot is that the island that you land on initially, Dito, in Inazuma, is very clearly based really heavily on a real island in Japan called Dejima in Nagasaki, which is where there was like a Dutch trading post and factory, which is like this one like island basically that was designated as this is like the one place the dutch can be and they can do whatever the fuck the dutch would want to do they can do that on this island but they can't go anywhere else um and so there's a lot of real history that they're pulling from and then adding these sort of extra fantasy elements on top of it to sort of establish this story and that sort of attitude about seeking eternity or tranquility the way that like the rebellion is coming about, it just is also kind of rooted in a lot of like the politics of what was happening in the Edo period, like leading up through to eventually the Meiji Restoration that ends the Tokugawa Shogunate and kind of replaces it with early attempts at democracy in Japan. Um, and it kind of feels like they're building up to something like that. And it's very exciting to see them pull so directly from real historical reference points to sort of create the setting of this uh, new story we're experiencing. Yeah, it's it's one of the many ways the game's worlds just feel so fleshed out. And re I mean, real is a weird word to use for like colorful anime game. But you know what I mean? It feels yeah. like it has a life of its own. It feels like this is a history that's lived in and you are stepping into. And that is so much of the fun of being the, the traveler, the Tabibito in these games, is going to these places that existed before you and will exist after you. And that's what makes it feel like such a fleshed out world. And I think bringing in all that Japanese history and then a lot of the aesthetics and visual culture and all of that kind of stuff um, is so fun and it, it leads to a, a, an area of the game that feels so different from the rest of it because yeah. in Liyue and Mondstadt I mean they are for one they're one contiguous continent so you have a lot of Mondstadt characters appear in, appear in Liyue and Liyue characters appear in Mondstadt and they talk about each other and they know each other and all of that but this is this whole world of characters who a lot of them have like never been off the islands and they don't know about these other areas there's this one just very fun little quest line where you're, it's like you talk to this chef uh, at one of the, the, I think it's in um, Yamisato's like story. Um, yes, yeah. Where mm -hmm. she, yeah, where she is like the chef at the restaurant, and you wind up making pizza because you found that in Liyue, which kind of, and I'm not sure why the pizza. No, you, from, it's you know. a, it's a Mondstadt recipe is the is right. mushroom pizza, and so you make okay, mushroom right, pizza. Right, right. Um, you make them. mushroom pizza, and then she wants to make more pizza, and and like the customers really like it, but they feel like it's a little too foreign. So you're trying to figure out what 
uh, Inazuma like recipe or like like ingredient will work best on a pizza. It's just stuff like that that's like very fun and adds a lot of flavor and color to the world. Yeah, and and it's it is just so suffused through the whole setting, and it's that thing where it's like it's why it's so much fun to just go around and talk to just random NPCs because mm-hmm. you get all of that like flavorful dialogue that like you can feel how much they've thought through the way the world works, and part of that is pulling on that real history makes it like automatically feel so much more real because it's pulling from things that are real. But there is this sense of like politics embedded in the fantasy that I love so much that is definitely there in Mondstadt. It's there in Liyue. And I think it's heightened in Inazuma, mainly I think from that contrast where both Mondstadt and Liyue had um, kind of somewhat similar relationships to their reigning deities in the sense of like in Mondstadt, like Venti slash Barbados is like totally hands off. He's the God of wind and freedom. He doesn't give a shit. He's just wandering around having a good time, letting people do what they are. Um, and Zhongli in Li Wei seems to have been a little bit more like of an active presence for a long time. But by the time you get there, the Li Wei you encounter is one where Zhongli is like intentionally separating himself because he's decided he wants to see, and then ultimately the culmination of that story is seeing that for real, that the Li Wei people can survive without having a god and they'll be fine on their own and they don't need him. And that's like the whole, what that whole story is about is that sense of sort of, you know, it's that how all Westerns are about the death of uh, the West, how all fantasy is about the death of fantasy. It's very much that kind of trope of, of him seeing that like, modernity is coming in and they don't need my presence anymore and that's how that whole story goes so for your interaction directly with Li Wei, you see a country that is somewhat autonomous from their ruling deity but when you go to inazuma it's the exact opposite right like like raiden shogun has basically implemented a dictatorship where she is at the top and she's making these intense hard-handed decrees that are like ripping her country apart like it's Something where I think you don't realize initially how severe it is until you get off of Narukami and then you see, oh, there's a whole civil war going on out there that because you're at the capital city where like the Inazuma castle is and stuff that you haven't seen that this is not just there's like some like weird uh, like decrees going on, but this is a full war happening um, in other areas of Inazuma. And that's just such a different sense of the world than we have seen in the other two countries that it just, I think, gives a very different flavor in a much more like active and kind of aggressive story for the, to be set in that you are a much like more like eager participant in in seeing all this happening and and you like eventually becoming someone who's so like active and trying to fight against the decrees that the Raiden Shogun is putting in place is a very exciting place for the the story in, in Genshin Impact to go. Absolutely, and I love how the story is paced. You you get. You had the whole prologue section, obviously, because it, from the end of the Liyue stuff on, it's like, how are we going to get to Inazuma? Because the Raiden Shogun is causing all these storms that's keeping people out. Um, I did love that the solution to that question is Beto, who is yes. my still my favorite character to play as. I was waiting for so long because they had never had any story content with Beto. She never had a character story. She never had anything. I was like, where I need my Beto content, my sick pirate queen. One of the other characters I got on my like first pull ever in the game, and she had been on my team forever. Her and Chi Chi. Um, and then yes, then finally for in that prologue section, and then she pops up a couple of times in, in the Inazuma story proper. You get full Beto pirate queen on her boat. She has a fucking martial arts tournament. She's friends with cool samurai poet boy. Um, I was so excited when they added that update and I saw that Beto was going to be a big part of the Inazuma story. That's got to mean we're going to get an actual character story for her at some point, right? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I can't wait. Beto is so... Because Beto is the one person who is always on my team. Uh She is the down arrow for me. She's always there. I always use her. She's fucking great. She's powerful as shit. Uh, She's the one person I have... Every single thing is up to the max level on, you know, it's just, she is, she's my girl. I love Beto. And I love that the solution to get into Inazuma was, yeah, it's hard, but I've got a cool pirate ship so I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's great. But then you get there and everything's restrictive, but the, the traveler has, is very like single-minded. People keep saying like, yeah, we'll help you, but do you think you could help us with this vision hunt decree thing? And she's like, nope, I'm not getting involved in that. That sounds like a headache. And then you get to that point where Kamisato tells it's Kamisato right yes. is her name Ayaka yeah, yeah. God Kamisato Village. yes before you see her outside of the veil because she's sitting behind like that tea screen right mm-hmm. um, and she tells you okay I will help you but first I want you to do these three little things for me I just want you to go help these three people who have had their visions taken away 
And so you go and do those three missions, and it, of course, it's kind of what you will predict, which is that it's really bad, and that's going to make the Traveler want to help. But it does it in such a nice, organic way, where you have these three really good character-driven stories, which is the meat and potatoes of what Genshin Impact does so beautifully. You see a lot of the world on that first island, and you get a lot of the culture and the sense of, like, the tragedy of what's being done to these people. And then you go back and tell Kamisato... Okay, yes, I'll help. God damn it. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the weeds again. Uh, and then you're kind of off to the races from there. And it's a really great... It really... I found myself so engaged where usually... I really thought I was going to be kind of off running around ignoring the story for a little bit. But I was locked in mm -hmm. through the, the campaign. And then didn't really go off and, and fuck around much until I was done with it. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience of where... Um, yeah, once I started the main story, I didn't do much else. I did a couple of like things on the way where I would explore around a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really explore Narukami Island until that first kind of like section of the story wraps up. And they kind of, I feel like they basically kind of tell you, hey, you should probably like... If you want to go do some exploring stuff, there's some time here for you to go, whatever. And eventually come back to this tea house. And so I did all of my Narukami exploration and then started part two. Yeah, but with that early part of the story, I really love that they give the Traveler this, like, stronger characterization than I feel like they are usually given, where you have twice, like, very definitively just say, I, I'm not here to read a lead a revolution. Like, I, I did not come here to fix your country. I came here to find my brother slash sister, right? Like, I came here to find my sibling. I came here to talk to the Raiden Shogun in order to, like, to, to find out what's going on with all this shit. Um, and you saying that to Toma initially and Toma being like, oh, okay. Because you, they so clearly are expecting this like foreign hero to like end up on their shores and just immediately go like, and I'm going to liberate the Inazuma and I'm going to blah, blah, blah. It's like, I'm the man or, or the lady, depending on which one you chose, who, who like saved the storm terror dragon. I fought the Harbinger Tartalia in Liyue. I defeated the god of the storm, Oslio, or whatever that fucking thing was at the end of the Liyue story. Like, I am the hero of all heroes here to save everything. And when you give that answer, Toma's like so stunned for a second. And then you go to meet Ayaka. The same thing happens. She's like, oh, finally you're here. Like, finally you can help us. And you're like, I'm not here to lead your damn revolution. And she's like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> then, and then she, you know, comes with the thing. It's like, I need to show you like how serious it is. And then once you see like the nature of when people are, have their visions taken from them, it's the same as having like their deepest ambitions and desires taken from them. Because that's what has given them the vision in the first place. Um, that you're like, okay, yes, I'll help you out. It's, it's, this is bad. Um, and I think that that whole arc, it's different than some, anything they've done in the story so far. Like, it gives the Traveler this much more strong kind of protagonist feel. And they've usually just kind of felt like this empty vessel for you to occupy as the player. Well, where they specifically usually characterize the protagonist is in your silly answers you yes. can give. Which is one of my favorite things in Genshin Impact. It's one of my favorite things whenever, like, like these games do it. It's something we all loved about Persona 4 when we uh -huh. first played it, right? Is how Narukami has all these weird-ass answers, and that's how they kind of characterize him. And they would do that with the Traveler. The Traveler is always kind of poking fun at Paimon and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. But Paimon is obviously the voice of the story for the most part. But I do love that I feel like they pulled a little bit of that personality into the characterization here, as you're saying. And it is it was striking to me, because I'm like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. But, like... And it's not that they're being like horribly selfish or anything. It's just it is this feeling of like, I I I can't fix the world and I'm not here to fix the world. But you know, gradually it's a video game and you're the hero. You're gonna fix all fucking seven continents. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm obviously. gonna I'm gonna be buddies with every single god on this planet, and then I'm gonna like spend a hundred dollars and have, and get them in my fucking team. <laughs> That's the subtitle, Genshin yeah. Impact. I'm going to be friends with all the gods on this planet, and then I'm going to spend a bunch of money and get them on my team, and we'll be friends forever. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, no, it's it's really cool. And, and I think, honestly, it only makes some of the interactions with Paimon, too, like, more rich when they're a mm -hmm. little more separated, you know? And Paimon is more her own character, which I did have a fun moment. I think it was during... I think it was during the, like, where you go and do the three vision quest things. And I was walking around with Paimon and someone was asking, like, what is Paimon? And, like, all this stuff. And I thought to myself and I realized, it's been so long since I started this game. I don't... What is Paimon? <laughs> and I don't know... If, no, does the game knows. tell you at the beginning? No, no. Like, okay. Paimon, Paimon is a weird floating mystery. Like, I think it is, like... It is an interesting part of the game where... I mean, so, like, to, to get to a little bit of, like, Genshin lore stuff, you have... Um, 
all the different gods are named after demons in uh, like Solomon's book of 72 demons or whatever. So you have like Barbados, you have Baal, um, you have Morax, right? That's what Zhongli's god name is. Baal is the, the Raiden Shogun. Paimon is one of those. Um, so mm. like Paimon's name, like I don't know about the character. I don't know what that indicates, but there's clearly like there's something more to Paimon. Um, but she's just this weird floating creature that like, is very funny and disarming and nobody think like looks much twice at her. It's like, ah, there's dragons and shit in this world. Like clay is a little elf girl. Like there's weird fantasy stuff. So they're all like, ah, she's maybe like a fairy or something, but yes, it is something where we don't really know. Um, all we know is that the way that Paimon and the traveler met is that Paimon was, was drowning in a river and the traveler coincidentally fished her up out of the river when they were just trying to get fish. And that is like <laughs> the, the first cutscene, basically in the game that information is given to you. And you and Paimon have been best buddies ever since, because, you know, eventually you're going to get hungry and you need some emergency food for you, um, floating around by your side <laughs> in case you don't have anything else on hand. See, that's the thing. I hadn't really thought about it because in every different cutscene, the traveler just gives a different joke answer about what Paimon is. Uh-huh. And it pisses off Paimon every time, who just, what an amazing vocal performance. What's that actress's uh, name? Koga Aoi, yeah. who yeah. She's Kaguya-sama in Kaguya-sama Love is War, if you've ever seen that anime. It's, it's a great performance in that show. And this is like, I do think her performance as Paimon, especially like seeing how much dialogue she's had to give over the past nine months. And yes. every time she gives it like 110%, it's like the best vocal performance in going in video games right now. Like it's so good in that it's, she's so tremendously funny, but also when there are dramatic moments, I feel like Paimon sells those moments so well too. Like it's a really yes. fully fleshed out character in a way that um, I think is like almost disarming. You expect it just to be, Paimon's just to be this like weird, funny mascot character, but I feel like Paimon has really kind of embodied so much of what Genshin Impact is to me that like she's she's like one of the best best things in the game. Oh, totally! I can't count the number of times Paimon has made me laugh raucously. Just with, even if she's saying something in Japanese that like I don't understand, the delivery is uh-huh. so good I laugh at it. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like okay, I didn't quite catch, and sometimes I do catch it. And I'm like, oh my god, that's fucking that's better than the English joke. I'm like, that's great. And sometimes I don't catch it, but I'm like, that delivery is so good. It's just yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Pim- <laughs> I love my Pimon, I love Paimon. Paimon is the A plus plus like great S tier character. Paimon. Every, every time you have uh, an option as the traveler to like make fun of Paimon, I sit up in my seat and just lean forward a little because I know you're gonna click that button and then Paimon's gonna go, "Hey!" and like yell at you, and yes. it's gonna be great. There's the part near the end of Ayaka's story quest where you're all getting masks from the one dude, and the guy says like, "Well, I don't have a mask that's the size of like a small floating child." He's like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" It's like, "Okay, fine. I'll next time I'll make a little tiny." mask for your tiny face yes it's so good um i love that because that guy wasn't even trying to insult yes. her <laughs> he just did never seen a paimon before oh it's so good yeah um and it's so fun to see. and paimon you can tell what a rich character she is because every time you go to a new area she's the primary interaction uh-huh. with all of these characters and she's just always interesting and funny and soulful and and has had to play off every single character in the game yeah uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's it, and and I do really like in this section. I do feel like they've written it a little bit where it feels like well, you still get to like tease and poke fun at Paimon. I think like over the course of the like what they've had of the game so far, they've developed like more of like a close camaraderie between the traveler and Paimon, where it feels mm-hmm. like a little bit more like it is totally tongue in cheek. Like they're both in on the joke, and like Paimon has fun getting mad and being the like this is where like the game feels so much like it is supposed to just be in Japanese is that her role is as a, what do you call it? Skomi, um, which is like the retort or like the character in Japanese comedy um, that you would, I guess you'd call the straight man in English comedy, but it's a slightly different dynamic. Um, and she's so written as that character. And at this point it feels like she's like kind of doing it on purpose because she's having fun <laughs> with it along with the traveler, because you've now been through all these crazy adventures together um, I, I think there's just like some subtle qualities of the writing that have it, like grown and developed their relationship over the past nine months of the game. Yeah, it's great. Um, and and as we said, even the characters who aren't going to be you know playable gotcha characters in this stretch are so good. Like Toma isn't being added to the game, right? He's just a. I'm in the world. I'm going to guess he's going to be in the game. I okay. feel like Toma and Goto have four star characters written all over them to me. Like <laughs> they I do. Feel they like, do. 
Um, cause Toma, especially cause Toma is also, you can see he has a vision and it's like a, a pyro or fire vision. And I just have to guess they probably have, were I making Genshin Impact, I would have designed his, um, him to be a four star fire character. That's like a support character that synergizes really well with Ayaka since he's a cryo main DPS character, um, that like a pyro support would pair really well with. If I were making the game, I would do that because Toma is great and he's funny, um, Toma, who's voiced by the actor who plays uh, the main character in Bleach and also Whis in Dragon Ball Super. Um, so, you, mm, right. Yeah. They, they always get someone very good. Uh, and they, I, I'm assuming he is a high profile enough actor that I'm going to guess that you're going to eventually have Toma. They haven't said okay. specifically, but that's my guess. Well, because they've got a lot more to add, as yeah. you say. We're only halfway through. We don't know when they're going to drop Ball um, or, or the Raiden Shogun. So, yeah. you know, there's that. There's a lot of cool stuff to come. So, yeah, no, you're probably right. I totally thought that about Goro, too. I saw the fucking tail, and I go, yep, yeah, he's there for the furries. It's great. Um, it's going to be fun. Yeah, anyway, lots of lots of good characters. But anyway, uh, it's uh, there's, there's a whole stretch in there where you do, like, the prison break to go get uh -huh. the guy. Um, where you have, I think, one of the coolest, like, kind of, what do they call them, domains are the yes. dungeons here. I want more of that kind of stuff, where, mm -hmm. like, because previously the domains have often been sort of Breath of the Wild-esque, where it's a similar architecture in all yeah. of them. Yeah, and they're, this like, felt... weird abstract spaces that, instead of, like, yeah. a real location that you're sort of going to. The Prison Break, which is the end of Chapter 1 of... No, the end of Act 1 of yeah. Chapter 2, which is really Part 3. Yes. <laughs> so confusing. Um, that that whole domain you do is a lot of fun. And the music there, which is like one of the main battle... It becomes one of the main battle themes on the overworld, where it's all the like drums and percussion. Mm -hmm. is so fucking good. I love it to death. Yeah, yeah. I love that they, they sort of gave it this whole like you're... You know, it feels like you're invading this like big Japanese manner Castle. like it kind yeah. of feels like that whole because it still has a little bit of like the abstract space construction in some ways of the uh more traditional domains so it felt a little bit like the end of season one of kimes no yaiba where you have like the crazy shifting castle um yes it kind of felt like you're going into that place it's very good mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i definitely got some infinity castle vibes from that so um Anyway, uh, now I'm now I'm imagining Mihoyo making the Kimetsu no Yaiba game, and like, that'd Fuck. be pretty fun. <laughs> you know, you could put their... Uh, I don't know if you saw this, Jonathan, but they did announce that they're going to have their first crossover character ever in the game. They're going to add Aloy from Horizon. Um, I did, and I wanted to ask you about that, because she's. they said she's not permanent. Does that mean, like, you'll lose access to her, or I'm it's not sure what it's going to work? Not how it's totally gonna clear. My guess is, I think, I think if you will get the character, and you'll have the character permanently. I'm guessing that maybe you can only... There will be a certain window of time in which you will be able to get the character. Um, and it will be early. You'll be able to get the character earlier on PlayStation than on PC. But eventually it will be available. On, you'll be available on all platforms. Um, yeah, it's worded in a weird way. But I can't imagine that they would add a character to the game that would mm -hmm. then go away. Um, but because they're adding in Aloy. Um, and I don't think there's a lot to talk about with that. Because there's just like almost no details on it. But that then opens the door for crossover characters. Kimetsu no Yaiba would be the easiest franchise to do a crossover character ever. <laughs> like, they're practically yeah. already Genshin characters. They have, like, their element. They use swords. Like, it, it is so easy to imagine how you'd put Tanjiro in Genshin Impact that I would not be surprised if that was, like, a Season 3 thing um, with, like, a cross-promotion with Kimetsu no Yaiba anime or something. That'd be funny. Because Hanai Natsuki is not in the game yet, right? No, he's not. So. Okay, well, because I, I don't I don't want to preclude the option of him being a real Genshin Impact character at some point, like an original. So maybe he can do both. We'll see. He's a, He's got range. Anyway, um, yeah. So what else do we want to talk about with the story here? Because it's at the end of part one, right, where you you go meet the, um, the Raiden Shogun? Yes, yeah, so that's the beginning of part two is where two. Um, you get word that Toma has been captured, right? You have that great scene where you do your, like... Um, kind of Russian roulette nabe hot pot thing and Toma has like yes. murdered himself uh, because he ate all the shitty ingredients um, and that's where then you can go do the character stories and they kind of say hey go explore the island do some fun and then come back later and when you come back you find out that like the thing that they had been preparing and I like this like little twist that you kept on hearing that like oh the whatever the that one commission that's like sort of the main army side of the of things they're like preparing some sort of like event or something so we have some time to get ready for our stuff so you go explore around you find out that event is like a commemoration of the 100th vision that they've captured which is going to be Toma's and that's where you have what is I think one of the coolest sequences 
in Genshin so far where you, the traveler, go interrupt the ceremony. There's this cool cutscene where you like jump in and grab Toma's vision as it's floating towards Raiden Shogun. You like use your electro powers to knock two guards on their asses. And then Raiden Shogun's not pleased with this, um, calls you like basically an indiscrepancy, like something that is not supposed to exist in this world. Um, she comes down and you get a big boss fight uh, that you obviously cannot win because you are fighting a literal fucking goddess. Um, yeah, that whole sequence is amazing. And by literal fucking goddess, you mean Miyuki Sawashiro. Yes, um, yeah. so that's where you have Miyuki Sawashiro, uh, the best voice actor in the world, one of the best people in the world. Um, she's voicing uh, Raiden Shogun or Bale. I'm going to guess that probably that character has like another name, like Venti or Jungli, that we just don't know yet. Um, yeah, that's where you also get the sequence that was in the trailer where she like summons this giant sh fucking lightning sword she pulls out of her chest um, and just is like gonna fuck you up. Um, yeah, I just had the biggest smile on my face that whole scene going, oh my god, they listened to our podcast uh -huh. last year where Sean is going, hey, why isn't Mayuki Swasher in this game yet? This is like made for her. And they went, hold my dandelion wine. You ain't seen nothing yet. Yes. You fucking idiot. We have the perfect character in mind for Miss Miyuki, or for not Miss, for Miyuki Sawashiro Sama. Yes. We're going to make her a literal god in this game, and she's going to be badass, and she's going to have like 10 lines in this initial stretch of story, but they are going to make a fucking impact, and they do, and it is, it's just so like, clearly they were holding a spot for that particular voice, uh -huh. and they did it, and it's glorious, and it is just such a like grand, like no character has had such a cool fucking entrance. Because I there's like... such a build up to it too. Because yes. you're just like even when like you've I you know they had some of those shots in the trailer or whatever you knew if you watched the trailer that it was Miyuki Swasher going in. Well, you knew if you watched the trailer and you're like a weird nerd like me, you would know. Oh, that's definitely Miyuki Swasher. Um, but like you play like five hours or something of of just the story content, not even including any exploring you did. And and everywhere you go, it's right and Shogun this, right and Shogun that. Like all the whole story is about things that she has set into motion, but you haven't seen her. Um, so when she finally shows up, you know, it's that like the third man effect, right? Where if you've spent mm -hmm. like two thirds of the story talking about a character and then the character appears, it's like, it just has this incredibly momentous quality to it. Um, and then when that character that is the goddess of lightning that pulls a lightning sword out of her chest and fucks you up, like she creates, it's like a whole Jujutsu Kaisen sequence where in that anime slash manga, they did like powerful characters are able to like create this like realm that they pull people into and it's very much has that quality with this like sickly red giant sun and all these like tori like shrine gates that pop up over the place and then eventually in the fight she uh disables your elemental skills because she is she decrees the vision hunt or whatever and she can shut your shit down because she is a goddess with her powers still intact um like everything about that sequence is i just think so perfectly put together Oh, it's phenomenal. And the third man is a great comparison because it's not just like we're going to build up to a cool character. It's we're going to build up to a cool character and we know it's Orson Welles on the yes. other end. Uh -huh. So we're going to milk the shit out of it. And then when Orson Welles appears, we're going to do a little zoom in and he's going to have this shit eating grin and it's going to be fucking great. And that's one of my favorite moments in a movie ever uh -huh. is just that little shit eating grin on his face when you meet him for the first time. And they basically do the Genshin e impact equivalent of that here with Miyuki Swashiro and it is perfect. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, that's a that's you just watch that sequence, and I'm like, uh, so here, Mio, you, know, you do I just like send my wallet to China? Like, how do I get this character, please? <laughs> like, it's like I will break whatever gotcha rules I have. Um, luckily, like with the way the pity system works, you, it is there is like a pretty clear limit to how much money you can spend to just like get one character. Um, but like, I will I will hit that limit if I have to, because uh, <laughs> I fucking you know I will spend money on that game for that character. It's pretty great. I just imagine Sean like putting his wallet in an envelope and writing China care of Mihoyo and just like putting all the stamps he has on it. Yeah, and it's just it's yeah, it's my wallet and like one card that just says Raiden Shogun, please. Um yeah. <laughs> it's a fan drawing of uh -huh. Raiden Shogun with crayon. Oh my gosh. No, it's a great sequence. And have they done the thing before where you fight a boss that you can't beat? Because like games do that all the time. But I don't no. remember Genshin doing that mechanic before. So I was... Because it's hard. She killed me the first time like before she's supposed to kill me. And so then I went back in. And uh, it's a tough boss fight just to get to the point where it kicks you out of it. Um, so it's very intense. And the music there, it's a great piece yes. of music. 
Yeah. And one thing that was interesting there, because I, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but like when I do like the main, main story stuff in Genshin Impact, I put the Traveler in my party just because it feels... Yes, I do too. Particularly the, like the early uh, Inazuma stuff. It, it like feels weird to be running around as a different character. So I had the Traveler in my party um, when that whole fight happened. And so I was I was running around as him. It was like, okay, oh shit. Like uh, this is the only person who can use any elemental abilities whatsoever. The only difficulty with that is that uh, I had the Electro uh, Traveler on, and Electro doesn't work against the Lightning Goddess, uh, apparently. Same for me. So, yeah, so I had a hard time with that fight where I had Eula as my main damage dealer. I had Fischl because Lightning works really well with Cryo uh, when you want to do physical damage. Then I had the Traveler, so two of my th four characters had Electro, and I think I had Jean as my healer. Um, so it was mostly me running around using Jean to get as much energy as possible and heal, and then just trying to hit her with uh, Eula's giant sword. Um, and like, because I think it's like actually a time limit. I think you basically have to survive the fight long enough for it to end. Okay. Yeah. Cause you can, you can like not see the damage you're doing to her. Like her health bar uh -huh. goes down like so in imperceptibly. Yeah. Um, but it is as a set piece, it is very cool. And then after that, you're going, you're, you're kind of out on your ass going out in joining the resistance. And then you get to go, you know, explore the other islands. And I think that's also like a cool narrative turn, the kind of thing that they haven't quite done before of like, now you're an outcast in this, you know, and a fugitive in this society. So it's a very fun and, and getting to meet those characters. And from this point on, it's sort of all just set up for whatever is going to come next in the story. But it's very fun setup, and I am excited to see. They introduced some fun characters at the Resistance. You've got your, your wolf boy. Yeah, Goto. Um, who, is he... Is he just a furry wearing a wolf thing, or is he actually like a wolf boy? I couldn't I, tell. He's, I mean, they have cat ladies and stuff. They have like like animal people in this world, so I'm okay. assuming he's an actual wolf boy. You know, like um, Ganyu <laughs> is half Keating, um, so so probably there is some sort of like wolf deity or something that like has descendants or whatever. Um, okay. I assume for that character. Yes, but you know, he's making a certain segment of the fandom very happy. Um, and yeah, and then I think the final like like event you do in this stretch of story, where you have the big battle on the beach and you declare yourself part of the resistance and you do your like one on one duel, which was I had to save a video of this because it was so funny. They do all this build up of like I'm gonna do this one on one duel with you, and they do the big like Ghost of Tsushima inspired thing where they go widescreen and they have everyone standing off. And then I had Hu Tao, and I just I killed the guy that was opposite me in like maybe less than a second of just going because Hu Tao is so fast and yes. such a heavy fire dealer i just like ripped through him back and forth several times and just died and i just was laughing my ass off because it was very funny in comparison to like the actual diegetic story going on although i do feel like the story is kind of supposed to be the traveler is gonna rip through these motherfuckers because they're yes. just like dudes with spears and swords and you can control three of the seven elements at this point um <laughs> yeah like i i, I like that there's like what do you think is going to happen? Like, do you really like, I mean, in the story, the Traveler, you know, didn't, certainly didn't win that fight with the, the Raiden Shogun, but like survived an encounter with a literal god. Like, what is like, you know, Kenji with his fucking spear going to do, you know? It's like, exactly. whatever. Um, yeah. But you meet several new characters in that encounter, right? Yeah. So you have, well, you have Kujo Sarah, uh, who's like the lady with the Tengu mask, um, who's part of the, the Shogun side. And she has a little appearance uh, during the jailbreak sequence, but that's like her big sequence of the story. You right. have uh, Sangomiya Kokomi, something like that. You only meet her briefly. The pink haired girl that has like that. She's like the actual like leader of the resistance. She's like the priestess. Um, she's going to be playable at some point, yes. I'm sure. She I think I like think a... they've already said that she's like a 2.1 character or something like that. Okay. I think they've said that she's going to be in the next update. Nice. Um, yes. And then you get, you know, your buddies Beto and Kazaha come running out uh, from the corner because you have a great interaction where they're like, you know, when I dropped you off at the beach, I didn't really expect that eventually we'd run into each other again. And this time you'd be a member of the resistance. Um, it's it's a good, like, quick little reunion we ha you have with those characters. You have a great cutscene. Like, I don't remember there being that many actual like video cutscenes mm -hmm. in the game so far but there's a bunch of them in the Inazuma section and they're great yes. they're really well produced they're very big and cinematic and I think this one on the beach where you have like the big battle and all the characters going off it's so cool and again like I really want the Genshin Impact anime uh -huh. I, they need to make that at some point just like one season for every like area of the game it's perfect you could do it in 13 or 26 episodes I would want Ufo Table to do it but they're busy I'm sure there's someone else who could do it justice but 
please, I want my Genshin Impact anime. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly the, the Natsuma section feels like it's structured in such a way. It's, like, very easy to imagine, like, where and how the anime would, like, an animated adaptation would, like, flesh out some character directions and stuff like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. It's, it's, uh... It's a really great, vivid sequence of story. That's that's. It's just like a lot more sort of like direct than a lot of the storytelling I think they did in Mondstadt and Liyue. Um, and and I think it's a lot of it is how active the traveler feels in the role of what is happening there. Um, and how mm-hmm. like the culmination of this arc of the story is fundamentally about the traveler going from someone who is fundamentally disinterested in the political goings on of this country and is just wants to encounter Raiden Shogun to being someone who is like the culminating moment of this update is the traveler declaring themselves to be a member of the resistance. And that's like the cliffhanger that leaves it off on. So it's like that focus around your character as like truly the protagonist of this section of the story, I think makes it a lot more, not to say that the Mondstadt leeway stuff was not engaging, but this makes it even more engaging to me than kind of the approach they took with the previous two regions. Totally agree. And as good as it's been so far, this all feels like set up for the uh-huh. next part of the story. And I'm very excited to see where it goes um, whenever we, we get that. I assume 2.1 will have the rest of the story. That's my um, guess. I don't think they've said specifically, but I'm guessing yeah. that'll be 2.1, which would be timed some, like, not too far away from the, like, one year anniversary of the game also. Awesome. Yeah, it's very fun. It's it's again. This is like the first time I've ever felt like episodic storytelling in a game is being done well, yep. and and that I I wouldn't just rather you know wait for it all to be done because it's it's still fun to play it as it's coming out, and there's so much and there's so much to do because then I finish that up, and you have a shit ton of world quests and there's so much cool stuff to do out in the world and I want to talk about that but before that, my favorite stretch of this whole update so far are the two character mm-hmm. stories. Which, I, they're a prerequisite to do chapter two, right? Yes. Act two, chapter two, part three. Uh-huh. Um, you have to do the Hino, Hinomiya, and you have to do um, um, Akia's story. And those you are got both, both his names f- wrong. It's, it's Yoimiya and Ayaka. Didn't I say Ayaka? No, you said like Hanukkah or some shit. No, I, I think I said Akaya, but I meant Ayaka. Uh, Honomiya, I got totally wrong. I'm sorry about that. Yoimiya. Did I say it wrong again? Yoimiya. There we go. Yoimiya. Yoi, like good, like yoi. And then Mia, like uh, Mia. I don't know what Mia is, but it's just, it's just a standard name ending. But <laughs> Thanks, Sean. That's just a great mnemonic. Well, yoi, it's well, yoi, like yoi, and it's Mia, like Mia. So, so if you yoi, remember that. Yoi being an old fashioned way in Japanese to say it's good. Like it's like yes. e, like yoi. It's yoku. Yes. It's good. Mia yes, is just a yoi name. Yoimiya. Okay, Yoi Mia. But anyway, they're great character stories, and I think Yoi Mia in particular has my favorite character story in the game so far. Yeah, yeah. I think both of them are, like, among the best. I would agree that Yoi Mia is um, probably my favorite. Um, Ayaka, although, has, like, a pretty deep soft spot in my heart because that is the one where... So you do that quest line. Um, I, I, Kamisato Ayaka is voiced by Haimi Saudi, um, who is the voice actress for Shinobu in Kimetsu Yaiba. Um, she's also... For me, Yukino Shida Yukino in Oregairu is one of my favorite shows. It's one of the, like, the best performance on that show. We also talked about her on the Gundam Age episode because she's Yudin in the first part of Gundam Age. Um, so she voices Ayaka, and they very much write her like she is a... She feels like she's the protagonist of like an otome game, which is a genre of visual novels that's like with a female character like romancing a number of different boys. There's something about the... like. So in Japanese, you'd call her an Ojo-sama type character. She is from this like very rich, well-to-do family. But because of that, she kind of doesn't have a lot of friends and she's a little bit awkward. And so that whole kind of like story about you becoming friends with her, it's a very tropey, visually novel kind of story. But I think they just execute it so well and tying it into her like digging into some stories she heard about her mother and finding out that her mother had this similar like thing where she kind of like came up with this whole alternate personality of just a normal person, a normal girl that could just do what she wanted, go to the festivals and not have it be a big deal because she's the heiress of the Kamisato clan and all that stuff. Um, and then that culminates in this just gorgeous scene where you're in that the 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 forest where all the tanuki are, and she goes and does this like traditional Japanese dance that looks like it's been like mo- motion captured with like an actual like Japanese dance artist that does traditional. Japanese dances um and I feel like at the end of that sequence if you don't if you have the the 
currency to roll for her and you don't i don't know who the fuck you are <laughs> because it's like because then because they have the the music swells and Ike has this beautiful theme and then the traveler and paimon walk away and the traveler hums high Ika's theme to himself it's just such an incredible sequence and that finishing that quest gave me like almost the exact amount of trino gems to be able to roll it was like 20 more than i needed so i had enough to roll and i rolled and on that roll i got Ayaka. And it was just like, this feels so fateful. Like, how the fuck? Like, it was like literally doing this quest was a thing that gave me the amount of currency that was just like, well, how am I not going to roll for this character after you just made me watch this scene? It's so good. She's so appealing. Um, And then I got her. And she's such an awesome character, I think, both in terms of her story stuff is very fun, um, but then also her gameplay. Like, I I haven't leveled her up all the way enough to, like, be the main character I'm using actively. But, like, I have her strong enough that I can kind of use her a little bit. Um, And it's a very fun, very kind of aggressive play style I like a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I agree with all of that. I definitely decided... Because I was not fully moved yet that I wanted to try for her until I got to basically the end of her story sequence. That and then the festival scene that comes after that. And it's just like, okay, well, I do need a better... My only, like, strong ice character I have is Diona, who I really like, but she's an archer who's not very strong. She's very support focused. Yeah, she's a healer. And I Yeah. And I really wanted more of a um an actual ice damage dealer because they wind up being very useful in this entire Inazuma region. And I thought she would go along well with Hu Tao. And then like it, like that whole character story really sealed the deal. And then I, I rolled for her this morning and, and got her. And yeah, she's not I have her at like level 40 now and I was about to go because you have to kind of go on a little journey to get the boss that you need to fight to unlock yes. some of her ascension materials. So I'm on that quest line now. But I, even as she really can't do any damage yet, but her dodge move, her like run is where she disappears mm-hmm. and leaves an ice trail. It's crazy. It's so easy to freeze people with her. And so if you put a water character in there or you're just in like a water environment and you can just string these incredible combos together where you get them wet and then you get them frozen and then you break Hu Tao out and just melt the shit out of them and then you get Beto out and just start electrocuting them. That's kind of my team right now and it's it's very good. So um, it's she's a great character. And yeah. yeah, I think that sequence in the forest is definitely the standout. But I, I think I, one like little parallel I like that they do is that Yoimiya's Mia's whole quest line is sort of building to the fireworks show. And then uh, Ayaka's, yep. did I say it right? Very good. Okay. Ayaka's story is building all to the, the little festival, the Matsuri that they have going on, that you can go to that festival area before it, but then you actually go there and they're actually, it's, I mean, I've been to Japan and I've been to like little festivals like that and it's it's very fun to see all the little vendors and I like that they all like her and it's like, we do want you to come out and hang out with us and she just has, as you say, it's a very typical story type, but it's just really well done. It's very soulful. It's, it's such a beautiful little story of friendship and you walk away like, of course she's going to be on my team because she's my best friend now, right? Yeah, and there's something where I feel like the... I feel like there's like the sh- a stronger relationship directly between her and the Traveler than there is with other characters um, in such a way that like going back to like the Genshin Impact anime idea, like that's one of the things that makes it very easy to envision that if you did the Inazuma thing as an anime, you could very easily recontextualize a lot of the story as being about the Traveler, part of the Traveler's role in the story is also helping Ayaka open up and she also is becoming friends with Yoimiya and Goto and like all these other people, Mm -hmm. you know, and her only friend isn't just Toma anymore. Um, It's like a really good, it's like, it's a, it's a character archetype that has withstood to the times for a reason. Like it works really effectively. And I do think a lot of it is also Jaime Saudi just gives so much soul and heart to the performance. It's a great performance. And yeah. and this is one of the places where I think the giant the Japanese script is able to do a thing that the English script just can't to like subtly characterize Aika, but I think it's so effective is that she is the only fucking character we have seen so far in Genshin Impact that puts San at the end of Paimon's name. She addresses yes, Paimon it's... as Paimon San. <laughs> And that, like, tells you so much about who she is. Like, the level of, like, kind of, like, respect she gives people. And, it's and but, like, when you add San at the end of a name, typically speaking, like, there are, like, you know, there are certain ways in which this can be done that this is not always going to be true. But, like, in the way that Ayaka uses it, part of what it's doing is it's putting a rhetorical distance between yourself and the person you're talking to. So it's, like, it's you are saying that, like, we are, like, equals in like kind of apart from each other like we're not friends we're not intimate and it's a way of you putting distance between yourself and, and the object of your language 
Um, and so her doing that with both, she calls you Tabibito-san, she calls Paimon Paimon-san. And it's such a good little character detail that is very cute. Like, I think it comes across as very, like, sort of, like, affectionate and kind of adorable. Like, it's a little bit of a character quirk. Um, but it also, I think it comes from a very real place in the character's kind of personality. Um, and I just find it very funny. Like, every time she says Paimon-san, it's just, like, you would never... Paimon is not a character in like or not like in existence that you would put San uh, at the end of with her name for a lot of different reasons. And the fact that Aika does, I, I, I just love so much. It's a great little like writing detail they put in there. Absolutely, 100%. But the Yoi Mia so uh, saga, the, the, the little character arc with her, is one that just sums up so much of what I love about Genshin Impact mm -hmm. and its writing. Because it is this... It's not technically optional, but it is this like side story outside of the main arc of the quest, right? And it it is built around nominally this very low stakes thing of she makes fireworks and she's going around getting the different materials for the fireworks and at the end they're going to do a fireworks show. And yet within that it becomes this really rich character drama, this giant slice of world building for what life is like in this place. You bring in other characters, like the the boy who's sort of living in her basement, um, who has to who you keep trying to help, and you, you've got this boat for them. Um, and then it also becomes the story of this soldier who's like become very hard ass, but also you realize is kind of questioning the Raiden Shogun's authority. Um, and it is visually just immensely powerful in places because it makes such great use of the Inazuma setting and the graphics. Um, it's just the whole package to me. I was enthralled through the all like 90 minutes of that quest. I think it was one of those things where I started it intending to like stop in 20 minutes and I just sat there until it was done. So good. Yeah, it's it's utterly phenomenal. Like and I think part of it is the structure of the story they tell because it starts in this cool way where it, it, it is... You don't start the quest like going and finding Yoimiya in the world and talking to her. You stumble on these kids on the beach and they're talking about some like the great Mujina monster or whatever. Um, and it's like a fairy tale that their parents told them um, to like make them come home. But instead they're like, instead of going home, they're like, we want to go find the monster. That sounds so cool. You run into them. Uh, Paimon gets to act superior because they're, she's talking to a child and she knows that Santa Claus isn't real. So you get some good Paimon stuff there. So she's like, gets to act a little bit haughty, um, which is always the best Paimon. And then you realize that, oh, Yoimiya is the person who's kind of like helped like kind of egg on this very childish belief in this like fake monster and you come talk to her and it's like this very sort of you know odd angle to kind of come into the story at because it's just through chatting to her that then it kind of turns into the fireworks thing and you go back and talk to her dad while you're talking to your to her dad the guy that's living hiding in her house that's like been smuggled into the country um comes out and like you have those interactions and then you kind of while you're going and dealing with the fireworks stuff you're also dealing with the story of this guy who left the country but has this regret of kind of abandoning his friend who then went to go join the shogun army um and that whole dynamic it's just such a natural flowing sense of storytelling that's so naturally embedded in the world it's where it felt like to me honestly like one of the major influences was probably The Witcher 3. Like, there's something about the way that the story just naturally sort of exists there and you stumble upon it. it has a similar storytelling structure to how The Witcher 3 handles most of its side quests. Um, that, yeah, I think it's just, like, a phenomenal piece of writing that then culminates in that gorgeous scene with the fireworks. And Yoimiya's whole characterization, where she's a chatterbox character. She just loves to go and talk to people and she loves to being with people, right? And then the ending of it being she's totally silent, utterly enraptured by staring at the fireworks and you have the conversation afterwards where Paimon's like, Hey, so what do fireworks mean to you? Like we've met all these people that fireworks mean something to them. Like it means friendship. It means marriage. It means dedication. It means whatever it is. What does it mean to you? Um, and Yoimiya doesn't have much of an answer at first. And then ultimately her answer is like, it's another form of eternity, right? That it is like this one moment that the, that only ex these fireworks only exist for this one moment and that's when the traveler has the line where he says to her, and that is another form of eternity. And it's like such a beautiful grace note to end that story on that speaks so much about like the culture of Inazuma um, and like the different perspectives of what this concept of the land of eternity kind of means or what it can mean to these people. A hundred percent. I think Witcher 3 is a really good comparison. Um 
I, I think it, it's down to every character. Like you kind of moved past it, but like her dad, her dad is a great character. Yes. And like they, they stress, they, they flesh it out where like he's a little bit deaf and so he can't quite hear. And it's a joke, but it's also a little sad. And like it feels like you could branch off and do a whole 90 minute story about that character. And just everyone you meet, there's so much depth to it. It's like any, any inch of the surface of this world you push on is going to push back in such a profound and meaningful way. And I feel like the Yoi Mia story is like 90 minutes to two hours of just pushing and getting these beautiful things pushed back out at you. Yeah, because part of it is like her function of the character being the chatterbox means that like you get what like are like basically like unnecessary details. Um, the kind of thing that like if you're trying to make like the most efficient script ever, you'd cut them off because it's not something that's contributing directly to like the A plot or whatever, but it's so much about what the themes of the story are. And one part of that is you talk to the guy who's like making the shitty boat or whatever that the, 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 the um, immigrant guy is going to try to escape with. Um, and he, you get this whole story about how, like, he has all these other friends, and then, like, they're in all these other places, and, like, they would visit Yoimiya when she was a little girl, and one time the guy came back with a friend, and he says, hey, you remember this guy? And she's like, oh, yeah, I remember you used to play with me as a baby, and he's like, no, I met this guy, like, two weeks ago, and she's super embarrassed, and it's just this whole, like, utter, like, non sequitur sequence that you get this very detailed, rich piece of characterization and world building around, um, that just ties so deeply into, I think, who Yoimiya as as a character. Um, which, yeah, and she's just such a fun character. She's so cool. So she's voiced by um, Ueda Kana, who's a voice actress that plays uh, Nin Tosaka, one of the main characters in the Fate franchise. So if people are familiar with Fate, you will know her. Um, uh, but she's in a lot of stuff. And one thing specifically, I think the reason why they cast her and this is one of the places where it blows my fucking mind that this game was not made in Japan. It's made by a Chinese studio. Is that the character is written as an Osakan character. And Ueda Kana as an actress is from Osaka. So she has a natural Osakan accent. Um, some of the characters mm. she plays like Tosaka and Fate doesn't use that accent. But she can because it's like her original accent. Um, so so Yoimiya, she uses that accent as the same accent that her dad has. Um, which I wonder if one of the six islands is maybe like this is fake Osaka or something and everyone from there has that accent. <laughs> um, but one of the things that's interesting is that it's not just that they just like cast Udekana and asked her to do the accent. The character is written as an Osakan character because Osaka has a couple of different sort of like stereotypes kind of about people from that um, region. Uh, one of the main ones being like comedy. So a lot of professional comedians, the majority of professional comedians in Japan are originally from Osaka or if they're not, they like fake the accent because it's like part of the kind of the culture and it's, and it's the accent can be read as funny um, in a like very kind of deliberate way. Uh, and part of that is that sort of chatterboxiness of it is very much like a kind of archetypical Osaka character trait. But the other Osakan stereotype is that they're like merchants because it's this like historical big port market city. Um, so another major stereotype about Osakans is that they are very frugal and they're very serious about business. And you have that whole section with Yoimiya where one of the characters tries to give her like fireworks materials or whatever it is for free and she says no like we're this is a business transaction like don't give this to me for free like we need to figure something out she ultimately settles on like i'll put this on your tab and this will go towards a future fireworks thing and that's such a sort of like archetypical osakan like mercantile kind of character trait and it just blows my mind that this character was written by a like you know a Chinese game development studio because it just feels so naturalistically something that is Japanese like it just feels like a character that would have come from a Japanese anime with like that amount of cultural specificity like a much higher amount of cultural specificity than what you'd see in something like Ghost of Tsushima which is still very good but like doesn't have that kind of like regional nuance or anything that it's going for um, it's just, I thought it was like incredible how rich and like specific the characterization was with her. That's so cool. And you definitely, even if you don't know all of the history you're talking about, Sean, you just feel it. Mm -hmm. You feel how rich and deep the character and the performance are. Uh, and then also, 
I am going to go after that character because holy shit, she's fun to play as. Yes. She's a fire archer who like is incredibly fast and powerful. Uh, I have not found an archer in the game I love to play as. Like Diona, I like, and I, she's a good support character and healer and stuff. But like, I, I have not. I don't have a lot of archers yeah. in my lineup. You, but, if um, you had Ganyu, you would know. Ganyu, okay. Ganyu is is probably the most powerful character in that game. She's fucking. Okay. I don't have Ganyu, yeah. so. So, but I will probably go after her because I still have quite a... I have a good number of Primo gems left over even after getting um, um, Ayaka. So I should be able to, like, if we have a couple weeks before that banner starts, yeah. I should be able to at least get to this part where you get the, the 50% chance, mm -hmm. which is the pity roll. Um, so I am definitely going to go after her because, holy crap, she's awesome. And there's going to be a new four-star character in that banner, so yes. that's going to be cool. Yeah. So definitely good stuff and... Uh, yeah, I, it's, at some point I'll just have enough five-star pyro characters to make my all pyro team, which will be fun. <laughs> it would be a terrible team, but it would be it would, I know. be it would be funny. Yeah, no. but she's she's so cool to play as and loved her story and yeah, really really special stuff. And I think I think that was the moment playing this whole 2.0 update that was the most powerful. Just like, oh my fucking god, I love Genshin Impact moment for me was just throughout that whole story and every as we said, everything in this update is great. But that was that was the one that like touched my heart the most. Um, I love it to death. This game is so good. Yeah, it's incredible. So, are there as we're kind of wrapping up this conversation? Are there like other pieces of like the world and stuff that you want to touch on? Just, I mean, not a ton. Um, but like all the world quests I've done so far have been very good. Um, I've really enjoyed. I'm I'm in the middle of the whole cleansing, the Sakura cleansing yeah. quest. Um, that's pretty good. I'm like halfway through that because I, and I realized I needed to go finish that because that's how you unlock the area with the boss that you need to mm -hmm. like upgrade Ayaka. Um, and then, but before that I had done the, the three part mission where you like cleanse the different temples so that you can clear the weather on that one Island. I haven't have done, done that, that one yet. They're really good. There's the puzzles there are, I, I guess I won't spoil it, but the puzzles are really different than anything else in Genshin Impact, cool. and they're very fun. I the weather was kind of annoying me on that island, so I went and did that as soon as like, I got it. I'm uh, glad I suspected that that was something that a world quest would fix, but I haven't because I kind of because how I played is I've like I mean I have I think 93 percent of Narukami Island explored. Like I like went hardcore okay. um, and did like everything on that. I mean, literally everything on that island that I could do because there's like two or three areas you can't access without leveling up your electrogram stuff. Um, and then I've just done like some stuff in that middle island. Like I unlocked the area in the dome in the middle island, but I haven't fully explored it yet. And so once I do that, then I'll move on to the third island, which is the one you're talking about with the storm. Okay. Um, but that's it's very exciting to know that that has a good quest line because i think for me so far my favorite quest line has been the shrine uh one in uh narukami because that is like very big and detailed like so big and detailed that it actually has its own tab like it's not just a in the quest menu it's not just a world quest it is like its own thing because that's like a two-hour quest line like it's a big meaty chunk of content um Are the, the one i'm talking about the like the cleansing yes one? Yeah, yeah okay cool yeah it has a lot of I, stuff yeah, I'm at the I'm at the part where now it's like open. And it's like there's three more places. To yes, go. yeah. So that's so, like okay. you kind of are like halfway through the quest line probably at that point. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I'm loving all of it, and I like it was it was kind of nice to go back on the world quest stuff that's like less story heavy, and there's a lot of cool gameplay mechanics you do, and it just sends you to all the different places in the world. Um, like I had I had been trying not to like make my quest log too messy, so I haven't picked up a lot of the world quests yet, especially on that first island. Mm -hmm. But now I'm kind of in that zone where I'm going around collecting all of those doing all my different upgrades with the electrograms and stuff like that so did you do fun. for that one because i don't remember when this happens did you talk to like the tanaki statue and all that yet yes okay yeah i really love yeah. that part of just like getting i just love all the lore like i love there's this yeah. all like the kitsune saigu like there's this old fox deity that you like a lot of that quest kind of gets into that those details and everything that happened with that tanaki guy um, you know, you have the Miko priestess uh, voiced by Aine Sakura uh, at Narukami Shrine who you see very briefly and all that stuff's really good. Um, one other detail about the world that is so cool, and that's on that third island, um, is that if you look on the map, right, you have that, like, gorge that just, like, cuts straight through the island. And then also on that island are these, like, s this scattered carcass of an ancient giant serpent. Which is a serpent. so cool. So that serpent is one that Bale like killed so whatever hundreds of years ago. It is the one that um, 
the Sangomia princess or like the priestess, the one who is really leading now the resistance, the island she's from used to re- like worship that serpent god. And that giant gorge that cuts through that island, that gorge was made from the Muso no Hitotachi, the like ultimate skill that the the Raiden Shogun has, because that is the killing blow that killed that snake, is like cut straight through that fucking island and it's still covered in lightning. Like that is the kind of like world building that makes me in love with Genshin Impact is like because Liyue has a bunch of that kind of stuff too. And then some of the like Storm Terror Palace stuff in Mondstadt has it where you just feel the sense of like the impact of history has like made a literal like mark on the world that cannot be replaced. Like the Guyun Stone Forest, which is all those islands in the southeast of Liyue, those islands are the remnants of giant stone spears that fucking Zhong Li as the god threw down to strike down the gods he fought in the Archon Wars 2,000 years ago. Like, that's the coolest fucking mythology you can think of. And to have it be this thing that, like, is physical in the world and you're walking around on it and there are little stories and pieces of dialogue and stuff you pick up along the way that give so much flavor. I mean, when I looked at the map and realized, oh, that's probably what that is, and then I found a character that I talked to that like confirmed that is what that gorge is, I was like, this, is, this game is fucking cool as shit. That is just it's, such a good idea. It's the closest we're going to get to, like, the great Greek mythology uh-huh. video game kind of thing like this. I mean, I guess there's like God of War and stuff, but you, but it doesn't. It's not an open world like this yeah. where like you can see the the like remnants of these battles going on. It's so cool. Um, yeah, I did I did some of the puzzles around there earlier today, and there's one that you do inside the mouth of the the skeleton, and just like you're crawling all over that, and you're like picking up like minerals and rocks off of it, and it's just like this is so cool. This is metal as fuck. Yes. I love this. It's great. It's so cool. Yes, the giant lightning samurai lady who decapitated an ancient serpent god with her muso no hitotachi which is like comes from i think that's like a miyamoto musashi thing like it's like the like sword without thinking or whatever um and it was such a great blow that it severed the island in half and where the island was severed is an eternal lightning storm from the remnants of the power of that blow (laughs) like that is that is the most metal fucking thing i've heard of in years I want that to be her ultimate when we unlock her in the game. She just cuts the world in half. It yeah. just breaks the graphics. It just fucks everything up. Yeah, it's just the fr- it, the game only runs at three frames per second, even on the PS5, after you use her, her <laughs> elemental burst. Yeah. Yes. Oh, man. This game rocks. Uh, I want to give another shout-out to the music. Yes. I think this the soundtrack for this area, I cannot wait for it to come out on Spotify and Apple Music and everything, because it is tremendous and it has in some parts very big Joe Hisaishi vibes uh-huh. um, the Studio Ghibli composer and probably intentionally it is it is gorgeous in that way but also still like it's so cool that they've had all these different areas and yet it is all still recognizably Genshin Impact like it is one body of music that that sounds like one body of music while having this incredible variety that's that's quite the accomplishment yeah one touch on the soundtrack I thought was really fantastic is that all the music that plays when you're on Dito, that tiny island you come in on, is all like very traditional Japanese. Like it doesn't, like it still has a little bit of that Genshin Impact feel to it, but it doesn't have any of like the piano or anything like that. And that more like the piano and some of like the kind of electronica stuff that they do a little bit in some of the Genshin Impact songs, that only comes in once you're off of Rito. So it just like, mm-hmm. there's, I think, a good sense of pacing there where you. I think the most sort of like unfamiliar sounding Genshin Impact music is all contained in that first island where it feels very like, you know, culturally specific to like classical Japan. And then once you're out of there, then like it confuses that more traditional Japanese style with that like kind of piano heavy um, music, like very strong, clear, crisp melody writing that the Genshin Impact music normally has it it kind of fuses those together that's the general approach the rest of the soundtrack has like that is that is some like a masterful like music with like world design and writing kind of bringing all that together for the for that like kind of focused experience and i gotta say sean why are we being so ludicrously spoiled on great video games set in historic japan yeah right we have neo one and two Mm -hmm. we have ghost of tsushima we have Sekiro, and now we have the Inazuma update in Genshin Impact. There was big stretches of Dragon Quest XI that did cool stuff with this. It's just like, it's everywhere. It's all great. They somehow are all taking like similar 
inspirations but doing sort of different things with them and it's like it's such a cool like little mini boom in the video game industry that like i feel like i should be tired of at this point but i will never be tired of they're all so great in such unique ways i mean it just feels like a thing of like the industry making up for the fact that we went like such a long time in the 360 ps3 generation with like no game set in that setting other than like a samurai warriors game from koei tecmo or something Mm -hmm. um so getting stuff that is like bigger budget like different genres in that setting um with on like modern video game hardware yeah it definitely like i feel spoiled because i just remember having such a long stretch of time where it's like because it was like the heart of me watching like every zatoichi movie and all that stuff there's like no video game to play that was a modern game that like gave you any of that kind of experience and now there's like half a dozen of them and they're all fucking great and they're like you know very different too like sekiro neo uh goes to and genjin impact all different kind of approaches all different kinds of games, but giving you such a cool, like, taste and feel from both this, like, historical period, but then also, like, a lot of the art and culture that Japan has made since, like, movies and stuff that is informed by that period and looks back on that history. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's so good. And, like, the the two best-looking games that'll come out this year are probably this Inazuma update and the Ghost of Tsushima PS5 remaster. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's what I have to imagine. But, no, it's great. And this one also scratches an itch that Sekiro scratched for me, where Sekiro has a bunch of stuff in temples and mm-hmm. castles that is so, like, especially because I played Sekiro right after coming back from Japan, and it was like, oh, my God, they got it so right. It's insane. And this this does not go as in deep with it, but there are some areas in Genshin that, that do that, too, where, like, you'll walk around on the floorboards, and they'll make the right kind of squeak that floorboards from, like, ancient Japanese history do. Very cool. Yeah, no, it, it is clearly extremely well-researched. And then you have the, like, the fantasy elements on top of it. I think one of my favorite visual touches in the game that make it very unique is you have all the sakura trees and a lot of the sakura trees are like like traditional cherry blossom like that kind of pink color but because it's the like electro land they also have some of them with these like vivid bright like violet uh leaves instead of the pink cherry blossom leaves and i think that is like such a gorgeous um like kind of painterly look to it that the Mm -hmm. game has and using that kind of slightly offbeat coloring for some of the the, because the grass sometimes has that where it's like Comes sometimes almost like a little bit too bluish or something for like real grass, but it, it, it captures this feeling of like another world in another place while being grounded somewhat in familiar um, plants in, in colors and stuff like that. It's just across the board, I think the art direction, particularly in Inazuma, is just like absolutely top notch. Absolutely. So Genshin Impact, we love it. We'll probably talk about it more, especially when that next update comes out and we get the rest of the story. But I'm glad we finally did a podcast that was all Genshin Impact, Sean. Yes, yeah, so the next time we'll do a podcast, and it'll just be me talking for three hours about how you do character builds and and I'll make a team for you. Because, I mean, hey, that Hu Tao and Ayaka, that is like a great combination because Hu Tao's one major weakness as a character is her elemental skill has a long cooldown. And when she doesn't have her pyro infused spear, she doesn't do that much damage. So if you're just swapping between her and Ayaka when either one is on cooldown, I mean, that's a great fucking party composition right there. Yes. Actually, last question. What's what's your party you're kind of running right now? So right now, um, I'm, I would pro- I probably would adjust my party if I had a couple of characters, specifically Kazuha, who I also have if I had him leveled up. I'm so fucking lucky that I, I got both Kazuha. How do you get, what the yeah. fucking hell? <laughs> hey, I play. I hey, I do put in the fucking work. I play the game every day. I, I get my primo gems and I get my characters. Um, so I don't have Kazuha all the way leveled up because I need some more of his materials. When I get him, I'll definitely swap him into my party. Um, but right now what I'm doing is I have Eula as my main damage dealer, um, who she is cryo, but her main damage mechanic is physical damage. I then have Fischl, who I have her for her electro ability because electro in cryo creates superconduct. Superconduct reduces an enemy's resistance to physical damage. So boosts Eula's physical damage output, which is my main damage mechanic. Um, then I have, uh, Jean as my healer and my Anemo support. So Anemo is really good in the game because it can serve what people call battery function, meaning that Anemo produces a lot of energy, which then recharges your ultimates. So I use her because Eula has one of the like highest energy requirements for an ultimate or elemental burst in the game. And then right now I have Albedo, 
I'd probably swap out Albedo for Kazuha eventually and swap out Jean for Diona if I were doing a more optimal party mechanic. But right now I have Albedo as my Geo character. He's mostly there because he increases elemental mastery. So that improves the amount of physical damage reduction that that superconduct reaction has. And he gives a bunch of shields through Geo that then makes Eula more survivable. So that is my party composition and kind of what I'm, I'm rolling with right now. Wow, you think about this very deep. Um... I feel a little embarrassed. You've put a lot of thought into this, Sean. Uh, I have sort of the two pillars of my party usually because I've been kind of sw- I'm kind of unsettled on it right now. But I usually have Beto in there and I have Hu Tao in there, and they're kind of both high DPS damage dealers. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just Beto, I'm just like Beto is just like part of my hand at this point when I play of like her fucking shield, and then she puts out all this. Yeah, Beto's and- like not so she's like a character that is not. If you make like a tier list, she's not a high tier character, but she is such a good utility character that like there are just some scenarios where Beto is just the best character. Like she's not always the best character for like the normal situations, but you just end up in places where it's like. I just need Beto, and Beto will just like solve this problem for me, and that's the kind of character she is. I just lean on her. For, I just always have her on there. Uh, now I always have Hu Tao on there too. Um, and then for the other two slots, right now I'm I've got Ayaka in there, and I'm leveling her up because I think her and Hu Tao are just a deadly combo. Yes, they're very love good. having them together. And then for that last spot, I usually have a water user in there because I find that just helps with like electricity mm-hmm. and ice and some other stuff. I had had. Um, Zhang Li, what's the little boy, water boy's uh, name? Uh, Jingchu. Jingchu, sorry, Jingchu. Um, I usually have him in there, and I don't. I kind of gotten tired of him because he's not like he's not a high tier character or anything, but he was good utility for some of his water moves. I like. Right now, I threw Barbara in there because she can heal uh, and add water to things. But I might wind up going. I still need. I would love to have a level five Anemo character. I don't. Mm-hmm. The best Anemo character I have is uh, the the chick with green hair. I forget her name. Uh, Sucrose. Um, Sucrose, yeah, she's really good, but yeah. um, and I have her leveled. I have her up to eighty. I don't have her at the max level, but she's plenty high to like use in a team. Um, so maybe I'll swap her in there. I wind up swapping around a lot, but I'm trying to like land on a team. I do think if I if I wind up getting more characters in the next banner, I'll have to start rethinking some stuff because um, there's there's a lot. I think Jean is going to be in the next banner again as one of the alternate five stars I saw. Um, yeah, I mean, she's always that. so like all the that original set of Monstat characters are always like you always have a chance to get them because it's like they're oh, like okay. the default characters of the game. So when I got Jean, that was actually on the Clay banner um, for the summer event. So I got her instead of Clay, but I was fine with that because honestly, I think I used her more than I would if I had Clay, even if I like Clay a lot from a, a character perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things I love so much about the game, and I think why I continue to play it so actively daily is that, like, I have hit this point where, like, the game mechanics and systems and the, like, theory crafting of putting parties together, like, grinding out artifact sets to, like, eke out that, like, extra bonus damage and stuff. Like, I find that stuff in the game so deeply engaging. Um, and there are enough characters that, like, so, like, Fischl is a character I used quite a bit really early on. And it kind of fell off of her and didn't use her much for a long time. And then, and she's a character that like in the meta of the game used to be very good and then fell as people realized like, well, like Electro is not always the best element to react with. Like, like water in cryo is much better if you have like a pyro main than, than Electro because Electro with pyro shoots the character, the enemy character away from you oftentimes making it hard to do long combos of damage. So, like, at high-level play, Fischl kind of became less effective. But then when they added uh, Eula, she's a cryo character that needs a huge amount of physical damage, and all of a sudden, that electro synergy became super important. And now, like, Fischl has, like, a really good place in, like, a really, really good team kind of setup that she didn't have for a long time. And that's one of the things I think is so fun and rich about the game is, like, every time a new character comes out... um you can look back on the other characters you've played with and see like, oh, you know what? I didn't have a used for a Sucrose or somebody for a long time, but now all of a sudden this ability and that ability can go together and make a really cool new combination. And it has kept the game feel incredibly rich and rewarding, even with like how much time I put into it daily over the past nine months since the game came out. Um, I do think that like we've talked so much about the story stuff and everything, and we don't want to go on for an hour about the gameplay, but I do want to just shout out that I do think the game is phenomenally well designed. If you particularly if you like that kind of theory crafting stuff and coming up with different team combinations, there is a huge amount of depth in what you can uh, 
put together with what's on offer uh, in the game. Okay, well, uh, Chapman Sensei, uh, what would you recommend? What's what's your team diagnosis for me? What should I do if I want to have at least Ayaka and Hu Tao in there because they're yes. such a good yeah. team? What else should I? Of the, some of the characters that you uh, you can ask me if, if other characters that I have or don't have. But so Ayaka in Hu Tao, I think, is a good like one two punch. So like when I used Hu Tao, I used her with Ganyu. Uh, for, I think, a similar reason why you'd want to have Ayaka. You need a character to switch Hu Tao out with in order to do good damage when Hu Tao is on cooldown. And that's um, what I use Beto for yes. a lot of the time. So Yeah. So, so like, I love Beto to death, but if I were to make, like, a more optimal team with what you've talked about, I would probably do Hu Tao um, and Ayaka as my main DPS characters. I would do Jingchu, the water boy, as my kind of setup character because water uh, reacts really well with Pyro. And then also within Cryo, you can freeze people. And then I would use Diona as my uh, healer and because she can also do shield. The other reason I'd want to do Diona is that if you have two Cryo characters in your party, it increases the crit rate of any character that is currently affected by Cryo. So if you have multiple Cryo characters out in your team, that means you're going to be getting more crits. And that's particularly for Ayaka. She is a crit beast. Like her crit damage, she's one of the few characters whose critical damage increases as you level her up. So if you spec her that way, she can do a crazy amount of crit damage. And then Hu Tao, I think is probably can do the most damage of any character in the game in a single attack. If you get a builder well and get a really good crit on her ultimate or elemental burst where she does like the big thing that regenerates her health also like if you get that and react it well and get a crit um you can do fucking crazy damage with that so if i were to make an optimal team with the characters you've mentioned so far that is probably what i would make but you should of I course you should of make others. yeah but you should of course make the team that you like enjoy playing with the characters you like right that is like my my theory crafted team that i would go with yeah i don't have one thing i like i don't have a ton of healers i have diona and i have barbara and I don't even know who else I have that like does active healing like that. There's um because um, uh, the only other healers in the game are Jean, Chi Chi, uh Bennett, uh right? That's that's the fire boy. I have Bennett, yeah. Fire Boy, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't want to use him though, just because Pyro and Pyro like no. you don't have like a lot of good resonance there. It increases your overall damage, but not in a way that's like as meaningful as getting better crits. Um I think that's maybe it in terms of like because you the other thing you can do instead of having a healer is having a a geo character on there to generate a lot of shields. Um, that's the other way you can get a lot of survivability. Um, if you don't have a good healer, but yeah. So and I have a bunch on like the low like characters I've unlocked but haven't done anything mm -hmm. with yet. So like I have uh, one of the newer ice characters. He's like a boy. Shonyun. Yeah, I think I have him. I have the 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 wolf electro boy. Razor. I haven't really used. Razor. I think I have Fischl. I, I don't think I've ever used Fischl, but I do think I have Fischl. Maybe I should give her a shot. Fischl might be pretty... I think you could probably make a pretty devastating Fischl uh, Ayaka kind of combo with how much crit she can do. You'd want to be careful with that. You'd want to avoid doing her uh, Ayaka's dash too much, because her dash changes her attack from physical damage to cryo damage um, for a short period of time. Um, but she does such tight crit damage with her charged attack um mm. that that is probably actually pretty viable um character combination if you wanted to do it i will have to i will have to think about all of this i'll have to look at all my teams because i i'm at the point where i can i have about eight or nine characters in the like 80 90 range mm -hmm. um but i could probably start leveling up some more um because there's some that just like i could i need to get from like 80 to 90 but i don't use enough to like put in all the effort yeah. and time like one thing i'll you know? say is if it's not a character that's like your main damage dealing character the one that you're kind of staying on most of the time like a hu tao or an aika like generally speaking you don't really need them at 90 so if it's someone like a diona or someone like that if you get them up to like 70 or 80 that's fine because you're what you would want to do is instead mm -hmm. use your resources getting a good artifact set on them and leveling that up and leveling up their skills because that has a much more overall impact specifically in how you'd use them than just their raw level so so that might be something to think about to make it more efficient is if you want to try someone out get them up to about 70 um because ascensions are much more important also than higher levels so like if you have someone right. that's level 80 and you ascended them so they could get to 90 that's like 99 percent of the way to that character being all the way leveled up basically so so you don't need to it would be more efficient 
to start spreading some of that experience around a couple of other characters to kind of play around with it, which is something I wish I had realized earlier in playing the game that like getting to level 90 specifically is not as important as leveling up talents and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So that could probably make sense. And I have efficient. not been doing a lot of the grinding with the other stuff mm-hmm. recently, like with all of the talent material and the weapon. Some of that stuff gets a little like, uh, now I'm like grinding through this game. Um, but, but if you're not doing it with like a million characters, it can be fun. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, that's our Genshin Impact podcast. Next week, we will be back talking about Gundam Age yep. again uh, for our next weekly suit Gundam, finishing up Mobile Suit Gundam Age. I'm excited to talk about that. And then we'll see where we go from there. Should be fun. Uh, I did see that they just updated Resident Evil Village on PC finally. After we talked about that last week where they had we learned that the piracy measures were breaking the game. They did f- apparently fix it. I'm going to try that this week if I can pull myself away from Genshin Impact long enough. And I want to talk about that at some it's point. It's good to know that Capcom listens to our podcast. You know, I'm yeah. glad that we have that direct line uh, so we can get some fucking shit done. Absolutely. But next time will be another Gundam Extravaganza. I'm excited, and we'll see you then. I got to get back and play some more Genshin.